Podmortem would like to thank Original Cinematic for sponsoring this week's episode. Original Cinematic is an independent production company that has made it their mission to create, produce, and promote films that are inclusive, honor women, promote the LGBTQIA plus community, and provide prominent positions and roles to POC actors and filmmakers and promote the films of marginalized and underrepresented populations. These are all things that are extremely important to our podcast as well. Original Cinematic is currently accepting scripts and treatments. Both William and Zena Rush are also available via email or Zoom to discuss writing and provide input and resources to all aspiring writers, free of charge. Their information will be made available in the show notes. Original Cinematic has multiple exciting projects on the horizon. Their next film, Immersion, is slated for release in early 2024. Upcoming films, Fetish, Sweetener, and Run, and their documentary, Drag, the most targeted art form, are anticipated for 2024 releases as well. Their new award-winning film, Group, is currently on the festival circuit. And very generously, Original Cinematic will be providing a link for our patrons to screen the film on Zoom. It is truly an honor to partner with Original Cinematic, and we can't thank them enough for their contribution to our show. And now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Salutations. Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Travis Hunter, joined as always by my co-host, my sister, and my brother-in-law. Hi, I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. This week, we're broadcasting live from an ancient crypt, discussing the 1960 supernatural horror film, Black Sunday. This film was directed by Mario Bava from a screenplay credited to Ennio De Concini and Mario Serendre, based upon the story V, written by Nikolai Gogol. Despite previous uncredited co-directing work, Black Sunday marks the feature directorial debut of the Italian master of horror a few years before he became the grandfather of Giallo. Originally titled La Maschera del Demonio, or The Mask of Satan, this black-and-white tale of supernatural revenge, loosely based on Gogol's story, provides captivating camera work, amazing atmosphere, memorably macabre sequences, and indelibly inventive imagery. One of the first Italian horror films of the sound era, Black Sunday is widely regarded for its cultural impact and lasting influence on the genre. This film was suggested to us by friend of the show and when to go getter, Felnez63. We'd like to thank Felnez63 for the continued support of the show, as well as this suggestion. So, Black Sunday, what were your first impressions on the film? This was the first time I had ever seen this. I know I've heard you talk about it before. Um, this was, these older movies, I know I've said that they're not really, uh, not that I don't enjoy them, but they're not really something that I kind of seek out. Mm -hmm. Um, but this was, this was, this was pretty good. Um, (laughs) there's a lot of the movie that's funny when it shouldn't be funny. (laughs) Um, and I think that's just kind of, I guess, because we're used to a certain style of horror Mm -hmm. and then seeing, and because this is 1960. Yeah. So seeing how shit was then or how things were portrayed then in horror movies, it's like, that's pretty funny. You know what I mean? Or like the things that uh, they do, you would think at the time they're like, oh my God, or whatever. And then us is just like, that's fucking hilarious. (laughs) Um, But it's, I, I do feel like this is, um, there are some things that don't work for me, but I do feel like this is one of those movies that if you've never seen it and you do love horror, at least give it a shot. You know what I mean? Watch it one time. Yeah. Because um, there is a lot of really cool stuff they do in this movie. And for the time, like you were saying with the atmosphere and stuff, it's really, really cool. You know what I mean? Um, I would have liked a little more, like, I guess, a fleshed out story or characters <laughs> mean a little more, but... I mean, you know, for everything else is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was very surprised at some of the shots. And I was like, that's badass. I was like, that's really cool. And again, 1960. It was like, that's, you know what I mean? That's impressive as fuck. I agree 1000%. (laughs) 
<laughs> I had never seen this before either. And you know Bava. You see, you know what I mean? Like you kind of know the vibe that you're in for. I was very impressed by a lot of the effects that they were able to pull off. I think that a lot of the shots are incredible. I think that it's a very beautiful film to look at. Mm -hmm. I have the exact same issue though. And my issue is with the story (laughs) and, and it's a pet peeve of mine. And I know that it is a tale as old as time. I know it's fucking goes back to even Disney movies, but the falling in love in (laughs) 0.2 seconds irks me, annoys me. um, And that is present here. Yeah. But I mean, I think, like you said, this is a film that needs to be seen if you are a horror fan. It is like a course in horror history. Yeah. And it is really, really beautiful to look at. And there are some moments of unintentional humor (laughs) that really just brightened my entire day when I was watching it. (laughs) But yeah, that is my... my, um, the the negative column really is and i i feel like people would be like well that's not really why we're here and like if that's the case totally respect it Mm -hmm. but if i the films that i choose to watch that are my taste that is what i'm going in for but i mean it is like i said it's it's a it's horror history it is a must see for that reason not necessarily for being told a cohesive or fleshed out story well (laughs) (laughs) no i i i agree as far as from a narrative standpoint there are a few things that i would appreciate more Mm -hmm. there is one aspect of the film that fascinates me so much and they spend next to no time on it (laughs) (laughs) but um i do very much appreciate just the overall vibe and atmosphere Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. watching this film really is an experience and i do think i mean there is a story there it's just there are some parts that are definitely expedited. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that as a whole, I mean, just watching it is such an experience. Mm-hmm. But me, my first impressions, the first time I saw this, I loved it immediately. Almost everything about it. And there are certain <laughs> things we will talk about. Um, but I actually watched this after I watched Blood and Black Lace and Black Sabbath. Okay. And so I had already really fallen in love with the style of Mario Bava films. Mm-hmm. But I was so intrigued because color is such an important aspect of Bava's films. Right. His use of it in lighting, in set design, in everything. Mm-hmm. And so I was very intrigued. And it was another reason why I really wanted to see The Girl Who Knew Too Much. Because I'm like, how does a Baba film go without color? Yeah. And so to see this, it maintains that feeling, but through light and shadow. Okay. And so it's a different way to explore the, I guess, visual delight that is Baba's films. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it's just, to me, it's just such an amazing piece of gothic horror. There are incredible set pieces brilliant music i love the music Mm -hmm. in this film yeah the use of lighting as i said and shadow to evoke so many different feelings the camera work Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the movement and motion of the camera but also the way that everything is edited together there is one sequence at the beginning with a mask for example Mm -hmm. that the way that it is unveiled we see it through so many different perspectives uh-huh. and we really just i mean it's it's one of those things that it's just like this is art this is art yeah uh-huh. and i feel that all the time whenever i watch bava films is it is treated so artistically and it's so creatively because it's a lot of things that we talk about all the time where it's like you didn't have to do that yeah yeah but you did and you put so much care into it and bava had a history as a cinematographer anyway before he began his career as a director Mm -hmm. okay and you see that he's the cinematographer of this film oh all right and often an uncredited cinematographer of his other films (laughs) oh wow so it's just so on display his skill and expertise yeah i just i think that it it's brilliant now to watch this film but i can't even imagine how people reacted to it in 1960 yeah I am. I was very surprised, and I'll talk about it a little bit in the production section of the critical response to this film. But then again, there are so many films that we talk about that become these classics that, at their time, mm-hmm. just were not respected. Right. Yeah. But as I mentioned before, I do agree with these narrative issues. I want. I think 
there are aspects of the love story that are successful, but I think that there is a more interesting love story that is not told. Okay. And I want to explore that because it's way more fascinating to me. And we get maybe two scenes with it. Yeah. Okay. But uh, we'll talk about that when we get to it. One thing that's definitely <laughs> important to talk about is it's this film's relation to Gogol's story V, mm-hmm. which is to say that it's not really. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, we'll get to that even more in just a second. I do want to say very quickly, because uh, we are about to talk about a lot of the historical significance of Black Sunday. Mm-hmm. One film that I do want to call out, another very brilliant film that is much more faithful to Gogol's story V, is the 1967 Russian horror film, V. Okay. I watched it last year on the suggestion of my beloved Jules. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the first Soviet-era horror film. And it's definitely worth a watch, especially if you love the story. You'll get it there. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But Black Sunday. Yeah. Not so much. (laughs) (laughs) But I did want to talk about the production of this film because it is kind of fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned a lot reading Italian Gothic horror films by Roberto Corti. It's a very incredible compendium. He does them by decade. All right. And so I this is a fantastic resource. But as I said, this is Mario Bava's official directorial debut mm-hmm. because he did have a couple of uncredited works as a co-director before this. And it's actually through one of those works that he was able to secure this job. Oh. All right. There was a film in 1959 called Kaltiki, the Immortal Monster. And he was working with another director. And that director apparently was kind of getting tired of the way that Mario Bava was so involved. (laughs) And so what he wanted to do was to just kind of wash his hands of it. Mm -hmm. And so he left this project and Mario Bava was forced to finish it on his own. Oh, damn. So he was too much of a hands-on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Toby Hooper. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the producers at Galatea Film saw this, and they were so impressed and so grateful for him finishing this film mm. that they were like, whatever you want to do next. Oh, wow. It's yours. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so he chose to direct a story based on V, the story from Nikolai Gogol, simply because he used to read it to his children at night. <laughs> which I thought was very sweet. Yeah. And one of his children is Lamberto Bava, who we covered in Demons. Yeah. No. <laughs> who also directed a version of V as an adult later. That's oh, very cool. Nice. That's really cute, actually. Yeah. But considering that it's not exactly a direct adaptation, it's very interesting to know how the film started as his first outline for the screenplay. Mm-hmm. He wrote it in 1959, and it wasn't a direct adaptation either but it was much, much closer to the source material. Okay. It was even called Il V. All right. But it was only after this outline is taken by Galatea that many writers start to have a hand in it. And what happens, according to Kerti, is even though two writers are credited on this film, in the official papers at Rome's state archives, 10 writers are listed on this Whoa! film. Damn. Oh my God. So you can imagine it's like, a what is it, the Purple Monkey Dishwasher? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And Bava even himself would joke that it it bears no resemblance. That's crazy. And his outline even was different. It started with a married couple and they go to a town and they <laughs> learn this story of yeah. the V. And when they learn the story of the V, everything starts to take off from there. But in this version, there's not even that married couple. Yeah. <laughs> I I can't. I genuinely can't imagine. No. Because I think collaborating creatively, writing something with just one other person is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that is, I can't 10 fucking, (laughs) there's no way. I just, for me, it just is very funny to think of it like getting to the eighth or ninth person. They're like, yeah, I'll take a crack at it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This has nothing to do with. There's no way. (laughs) And I will say, admittedly, I say it has nothing to do with, but there are certain elements that you're like, oh, well, that's from V, clearly. Right. Well, they're just left behind remnants. But as far as, you know, the actual story itself, not so much. (laughs) But, and I, I similarly spoke of this on episode 179 in Black Sabbath, where I wondered if it seemed like it was a style of the time to claim works were adaptations so you could use the names of these authors yes. in marketing. Oh, uh, okay. And it is an interesting tactic because you're marketing an original idea based on this well-known name. Right. And so it kind of allows for more creative stories to be told, but anybody seeking a true adaptation is not going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. 
But the interesting thing that I did read is that horror films were banned in Italy until like the 1950s. Huh. It was a period of time, I think it had to do with the government and censorship. Okay. Because there were silent Italian horror films, but then when it comes to Italian horror films of the sound era, as I said, this is maybe the third one. Wow. Yeah. In 1960. So when you look at it with that context, you see it kind of as this burgeoning subgenre in Italy as far as films are concerned. Yeah. And so you see it kind of where the influences of things that came before it. Mm -hmm. Some films that were cited, Hammer's Horror of Dracula, mm -hmm. of clearly universal horror films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Murnau's Nosferatu. Okay. We see visual references to all of these. Yeah. But something that's very interesting about it as well is even though it bore these influences of its predecessors, it also became incredibly influential in its own right mm -hmm. because it's basically responsible completely for pioneering the Italian Gothic horror film, period. Yeah. Ah. And very similarly in the way that Blood and Black Lace defined Giallo, okay. this contained elements that other directors would take and run with. So Mario Bava is just creating shit just yeah. <laughs> yeah. left and right that people are taking from even today. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting thing I learned from Curti's book is he said it was somewhat revolutionary in its time anyway for its depiction of female empowerment and desire mm -hmm. because the obvious power dynamic and eroticism that's inherent in the lore of vampirism. Mm -hmm. But there's also parts of it that kind of echo contemporary mores of purity and youth almost as a form of currency. Yeah. yeah. So it is a bit of a mixed bag on that front. But then again, you got to remember it was 1960. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was seven weeks of production. And after its release, it really, really was very poorly received in Italy. Really? Yeah. They cited and they picked it apart. One, one thing that critics talked about a lot was Bava's over-reliance on Zooms, which I <laughs> don't, I don't think is accurate or fair. <laughs> What a weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> but they said that and obviously the subject matter and the content. That is not surprising yeah. to me. But people talked a lot about Zooms. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some Zooms. There's some. There's, there's some, some Zooms. Not enough to be like, this, this guy dude, with the Zooms. I, it's borderline. Yeah. <laughs> it's borderline. I, I, more Zooms, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but American International Pictures scoops it up. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about on Black Sabbath, they, of course, made their cuts. Mm -hmm. They changed the score, which they did also on Black Sabbath. And in releasing it in the States, it becomes their most profitable film ever at the time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so that kind of solidifies the relationship between Galatea and American International Pictures at the time, mm -hmm. which is how we get Black Sabbath in the future, is through the success of this film. Also, the title, Black Sunday, they yeah. titled it Black Sabbath based on the success. Okay. I, I kept having to not call it that Dude, or think it that. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you right now, if I say Black Sabbath, you got to yeah. forgive me. <laughs> it's like Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster all it's, over again. Uh, it's too close. <laughs> but it's it's just such a remarkable film and such an important film historically. Mm -hmm. And its influence is just undeniable. It's too many films, honestly, to even name. Okay. People consider it the first great Italian horror film. Some people consider it the first Italian horror film, which is inaccurate. But mm -hmm. it people consider it. Yeah. yeah. But um, I did read an article by Nat Bremer, and I had had... A revelation watching it because I had connected it to the beginning of another film that we've covered before mm -hmm. that it's so similar and even the story that's told is similar is just told in a different way. Yeah. Which is The Lords of Salem. Huh. Okay. But Bremer's article posits that the autopsy of Jane Doe is basically Black Sunday with kind of just a different coat of paint. Okay. All right. And so just when you think of it that way, this story, that was, it's not V. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this story and this film is just so influential that you can even see parts of it in films you don't even realize. Yeah. So I'm That's just really like. That's really cool. Yeah. Now, before we curse this film's bloodline, we would like to issue a warning for spoilers. Pod Mortem is a very in-depth podcast and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. 
If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, let's seek our vengeance. So the film begins with a flourish of dramatic orchestral music before fading into the warm light of a burning fire. The camera pulls back to reveal the fire raging over a small pit of coals, sharp instruments resting in it as a brand is readied by a large, uncredited man in an executioner's hood. I was like, okay, so we're jumping right the fuck in. <laughs> like, there's no easing into the story. Yeah. No, not at all. Two other large men in similar garb stand guard as we pan across skeletal trees, spying through twisting branches to find a row of men in black cloaks, each of them holding lit torches through the darkness of night. At the center of the cloaked men stands Griabi Vaida, played by Ivo Garani. A narrator with the voice provided by George Gagneau in the English dub and Nando Gazzoli in the Italian version explains. In the 17th century, Satan was abroad on the earth and great was the wrath against those monstrous beings thirsty for human blood, to whom tradition has given the name of vampires. He continues that no appeal for pity or mercy availed. Brothers did not hesitate to accuse brothers, and fathers accused sons in the frantic attempt to purify the earth of that horrible race of blood-devouring assassins. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. So was he he's saying abroad like there? Because this is the 60s, or is he saying like abroad? <laughs> oh, come on. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a cigarette. Yeah, I was going to say he puts his hat on and fix it. It's Mad Men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, one thing I will say about this, because they are talking a lot about vampires. Mm -hmm. They also talk a lot about witchcraft. Yeah. yeah. There is some amount, it seems, of confusion, they say. Okay. Where film historians are like, they might have meant this and done this because even early on, they had actually fitted the actors who play these characters with fangs. Okay. okay. Yeah. But See, then they took them out because it just didn't work. And also the actors complained about them. I, that, it confused me a little mm -hmm. because I didn't fully understand really what story was being told here. One thing about Black Sunday is you're going to get everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Yeah, because even zombies are like, sure. Yeah. yeah. Why the fuck not? <laughs> Throw it in the pot. I, 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 it did confuse me too because I felt like later on something that happens, I was like, oh, you're just kind of making your own thing up with it. All right. Yeah. But it is a little kind of like, so are they witches? Are they vampires? Mm -hmm. like, I don't know what I'm getting here. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Just they do said, everything. Yeah, yeah, added the, some witchcraft. You got yourself a stew going. All right. <laughs> D, all of the above. Yeah. Yes. And I think in the original story, there is more about witchcraft. I feel like this is, and it has uh, thematic imagery mm -hmm. of witchcraft with what we see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, there is such an element of vampirism. Maybe yeah. she's a vampiric witch. Okay. And I love that for her. Yeah. Good for her. This is a good for her film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But in the middle of a clearing, two large wooden stakes have been erected. A man lies motionless against a distant one, tied to it with rope and wearing a mask on his face, a griffin emblazoned on his cloak. The executioner, with his brand fresh from the fire and glowing brightly, approaches the nearer stake, where Asa Vida, played by Barbara Steele, is tied with her arms wrenched above her head. So Barbara Steele... Mm -hmm. iconic iconic would go on to become a horror icon mm -hmm. people refer to her as one of the first scream queens okay she really makes her mark in this film and kind of takes off from here mm -hmm. i believe it was from this film that she was cast in the pit and the pendulum oh okay so this kind of really kick-started her career in a very exciting way uh-huh well, she's really good in this. I don't want to give anything away, but um, there is some range. Yeah. <laughs> uh, her eyes yes. yeah. are fucking gorgeous and haunting. She really does have the look. I did read that she did a lot of like um, stage work before this, mm. that she was discovered painting. She was a painter. Okay. Um, painting a, a set. That's why, oh, wow. which was always like my fantasy when I was a kid that I was just going to be like walking around the commissary and somebody was going to be like that <laughs> child right there. Is that why you're always painting those sets? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bring them with me. It's like, what is this? <laughs> There's no room for me in the car. Yeah. I am the next Barbara Steele is what I'm saying. <laughs> it just hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but in a very tattered gown, Aza faces away from the executioners as the narrator continues 
that before the accused were put to death, human justice anticipated divine judgment by burning into the flesh of the damned ones, the brand of Satan. As two executioners hold Asa to the stake, Griabi gives the order through the veil of twisted trees, and the lead executioner brands Asa in the center of her back. Her screams echo through the trees as we see very closely a capital S being seared into her skin from the smoldering steel. She does scream, but honestly, she takes that like a champ. Yeah. Like, she just keeps it moving. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's next? Yeah. The, better than me, I will say. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I swear, seeing this, I was like, God. Yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> they spent a lot of time. And the thing is, is, again, with a lot of these films, you know how a lot of it was done. Yeah. And, and a lot of things we'll learn. I have no idea how it was done. Uh-huh. Yeah. But this, you know, it's, it's a wax facade. Yeah. Seared into it, probably with a real... Brand. Yeah. I'm sure. But the visual of it in black and white, it looks so painful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't even matter. Like you're saying you can tell that it's wax. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't it doesn't it does a really good job or Baba does a really good job of not taking you out of that. Like, yeah, you know what it is, it doesn't matter. You're still seeing the movie. Mm-hmm. You still feel that pain. Like, damn, that's fucked up. <laughs> yeah, you're still like, God damn. Yeah. yeah, and at this time, when you think about horror films in the 60s, this is stuff that you kind of, is is implied. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't see the fucking brand, like, for 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the wind howls around the congregated men and the accused as Aza turns towards Griabi with a pained and scornful look in her eyes. Griabi proclaims to Asa daughter of the house of Vida, that this high court of the Inquisition of Moldovia has declared her guilty. Loathing leeches from every look from Aza, as Griabi announces that he, the second born of Prince Vida, as Grand Inquisitor, condemns her, and as her brother, he repudiates her. I know the narrator said it. I yeah. know. God damn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I uh, was surprised. So what what are the charges again? What are we cuz uh, there's a lot I think my any of my sisters, my oldest sister or my little sisters would have to do before I decided that I needed to tie them to a tree mm-hmm. and set them on fire. I mean there's a lot. I'd hide a body for them. Mm-hmm. I I mean there's a lot. I mean they're my sisters. But I mean can, I, can we know? I think the charges were uh, vampire witch zombie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's it's enough, a, though. It says right here. Yeah, first, vampire witch uh, zombie. First can, degree. Yeah. <laughs> can we get a little more? I don't know. I don't know if that's enough. <laughs> I, and I will say again, if you, we think about it now, and we're like, God damn, but in the 17th century, I think this was just a, like everybody was yeah. doing this. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> it was just, yeah. Did you steal that piece of bread? Get up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But he admonishes her for her evil deeds committed to satisfy her monstrous love for the servant of the devil, Igor Yavutic. Smoke surrounds Igor Yavutic, played by Arturo Domenici, and we see that he is the man laying dead against the other stake, his face shrouded in a monstrous mask of metal. I will say, and there is something that a lot of people claim, and I don't, I understand later because we see two portraits in a castle. Mm Mm-hmm. People seem to think that Yavutic and Asa are related. I do not get that at all. What? Yeah, I didn't either. Because wouldn't he say, and my brother? Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was her man. It is. I don't know why a lot of people are saying that. Ew. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't get that at all. No. I'm like, this is clearly, she's cavorting and possibly (laughs) possibly fornicating with (laughs) come on (laughs) there they are it's a vampire witch you know that's that's what they do yeah it's part of it Mm -hmm. but i think that uh this is part of something that begins as far as a love story that i want more of okay yeah and it really (laughs) yeah it doesn't it doesn't (laughs) let's see what this guy's talking about But the light of the cloaked men's torches flicker through the fog as Griabi declares for God to have pity on Asa's soul in this, her final hour. Asa turns her head to see Yavutic's dead body, surrounded by the billowing fog, and as tears of fury fill her expressive eyes, Griabi instructs the men to cover Asa's face with the mask of Satan and to nail it down. I was like, a mask isn't so bad. A gulp. I was yeah. like, oh no. Wait, that, were these masks? Yeah. Not yeah. the nail it down part. Dude, Halloween. Yeah, no, no, thank you. No, we're not, we don't need to trick or treat this year. We're fine. We're fine, thank you. 
But Griabi says that he hopes that the cleansing flames of her immolation will reduce her foul body to ashes so that the wind will obliterate all traces of her existence. It's a little petty, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> But we then watch as the executioner retrieves the mask of Satan from the ground, its face sinisterly sculpted. And when he turns it around, he reveals its interior is lined with sharp spikes to impale the face of the unfortunate wearer. In an amazing transition, the executioner steps towards us, placing the mask on our face momentarily, only for the camera to follow through the mask on its macabre march over to Asa. This is, again, amazing. Yeah, Yeah. it was really cool. I felt like Scorsese was like, this is cinema. (laughs) (laughs) But the surrounding flames cause the shadows of the spikes to dance across the interior of the mask as Asa fearfully struggles in vain to free herself from her restraints. I did want to point out, I learned on commentary, there was a really good commentary track from Tim Lucas. He's a film historian. Uh He shared that this mask was designed by Eugenio Bava, Mario Bava's father. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. So he was putting this shit on people. Oh, yeah. Well, he's like, this is, you can just borrow this. Yes. I, guess. <laughs> I have like 10 of them. <laughs> Didn't he make the face from the drop of water in Black Sabbath too? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. See, I learned this. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was very, very prevalent in Italian films, I think since like the 19... 19- Tens, if I'm not mistaken. Damn. Damn. And so whenever Mario Bava started working in films, it was really following in the footsteps of his father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Lumberto Bava, like his father before him. Yeah. All right. Love it. But the men tie Asa down tighter. And as she rests against the stake, her eyes grow wide as she shouts to Griabi that it is she who repudiates him. And in the name of Satan, she places a curse upon him. I was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> I gotta gotta she it. admitted it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to be honest. I was very surprised because I thought this was an, like a false Absolutely. accusation. Yeah. Yeah. But she's like, no, I've been very good friends with the devil. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> I I was like, yeah, bitch, tell him. Yeah. Like, oh, no, you're cursed. Yeah. Well, we can dig it. I will yeah. say. She said it bounces off of me and sticks to yeah. you. <laughs> this is the first case of that. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> if you mess with my man, I'm going to be the one to bring no. it to you. <laughs> she's not playing. And I, I'm here for it. Yeah. But she urges him to go ahead and tie her down to the stake. But she declares that he will never escape her hunger, nor that of Satan. She smiles certainly as she looks up to the sky, thunder crackling and lightning flashing. She continues that the unchained elements of the powers of darkness are lying in ambush, and she warns Griabi that her revenge will strike him down and his accursed house, and in the blood of his sons and the sons of his sons she will continue to live immortal. Well, you're never beating the allegations now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's just, it's she done. pleads guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you caught that. But, but see, <laughs> if you wouldn't have put your sister up there in the first place, you wouldn't have to worry about it. wouldn't have to do any of, of this. And what's funny to me is there's no point that Griabi's like, oh, well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that sounds, that's worse yeah. than what I'm doing, I think. <laughs> I also feel like everyone is very calm about this. Yeah. And for, you know that she's doing all this stuff, so you have to believe that it works in some yeah. Way, yeah, I'd be like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> like, I would be in a full panic. They're just like, G-U-I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't give a fuck. Well, they're like, we want to deal with that. <laughs> My sons, you said, sure, dude. <laughs> right, that's later. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> but she vows that they will restore to her the life that he now robs from her. She groans wildly as the men hold her to the stake and place over her face the mask of Satan. In one final threat, Azza promises to return to torment and destroy throughout the nights of time. The lead executioner stands ready with a large mallet as foreboding drums pound in the score. Griabi gives the order, and the hammer comes down in one strong swing, driving the spikes into Azza's face, blood cascading over and out of the mask as Azza's life is taken. We press in on the mask, now worn forever on Azza's face, and we get the title... The Mask of Satan, or Black Sunday, followed by the opening credits. Didn't this happen to Leonardo DiCaprio one time? <coughs> I feel like he just wore it for fun. I don't remember that, what that oh, movie was He about. did that to himself. <laughs> was he the man in the Iron Mask, or was he just in the he man? He was the, the Iron Mask. He was... He was playing the mask? Yeah, he just like hugged the people's head. That was, was like Jim the, Carrey. Did somebody oh, stop him? Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't think this is... He was the mask. Yeah. The Cuba Pete mask? Yeah. <laughs> Go to IMDb. Don't listen to us. <laughs> Do not... We, we're off the rails. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to say what an opening. Yeah. Yeah. 
this to me is probably one of my favorite opening sequences in horror period that was really cool like you said i wasn't expecting that and mm-hmm. when she did come out and she's like fuck you dude i was like oh yeah like, oh my god well it's a good thing they like contained the evil and shut her down i mean honestly because mm-hmm. that could have really led to some bad stuff yeah they knew what oh. they were doing because this will never come back to no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not in one year or 200 years no. yeah. nothing, nothing. specifically <laughs> <and it's>, exactly <laughs> I, I couldn't help. And I, again, I know that what I don't know what she did, her crimes or whatever, but I feel like there is something so impactful in her performance and her certainty that I'm kind of rooting for her. Yeah. <laughs> like, and you know that you shouldn't. I know yeah. I shouldn't, but I was like, huh. But I, because I, I felt like Bud and Kill Bill, I was like, that woman deserves her yeah. revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and we deserve to die. <laughs> Which would make more sense if she wasn't claiming to have Satan on speed dial. Yeah. But again, support women's rights and wrongs. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I did want to say in the opening credits, I don't know why, but they do misspell Barbara Steele's name. Don't get it. Yeah. But things happen, I guess. I read a lot of stuff that there was drama on set yeah. with her. I wonder if it was like a, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know. I always assume There's, petty. Because yeah. Yeah. how do you do that? You just miss an E, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but how many hands did that have to go through? For it to think oh, that. Yeah. yeah. It was, maybe it was intentional. You know? I will say the theme music is brilliant and incredible. Mm-hmm. Composed by Roberto Nicolosi, who scored quite a few of the films directed by Mario Bava. Some of the ones he uncredited, co-directed as well. Okay. But he also went on to score Bava's films, Eric the Conqueror, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, and Black Sabbath. Oh. All right. So you probably recalled his music. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like there are some motifs in this film. I can't prove it. I need to rewatch the film. I've watched it a million times, but I think some of the things are used in Blood and Black Lace. Oh, okay. Even though it's a different composer, but I it was too familiar. <laughs> it was just too familiar. <laughs> <laughs> but the image of the mask gives way to the cloaked men walking through trees following their murder of Asavida. The executioners carrying her body and the body of Yavutich above their heads in a slow procession to their eventual cremation. Thunder shatters the silence of the night as Asa's body rests on her stake at the center of a mound of kindling. The cloaked men gather around her with their torches, accompanied by women and townsfolk, ready to burn the vampiric witch to ash. But before they can, the sky opens above them, crying down rain and preventing their plans for the pyre. The narrator shares that as if by the demon's command, the sudden fury of the elements extinguished the purifying flames. Aza lies dead against her stake, her death mask nailed into her face as the townsfolk run away to escape the torrential downpour. Again, more afraid seemingly of the rain than of this woman saying like, oh, we're coming, we're coming back, you <laughs> bastards. She's Harry Warden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, wouldn't you think so? You're sitting there in your wet robe. You look over to the guy next to you. He's wet. It's like, like that lady said it wasn't going to last. You know, killer. again. The guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting two and two together and getting that she's coming for our ass. Yeah. Like, that's what I think. <laughs> but one thing that is very funny to me is like, they're like, okay, we tried one night to burn her. Yeah. <laughs> Never again. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, sure it's so, fine. Yeah. We can just, she's dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just laziness. Right? It really yeah. is, dude. And then. <laughs> Especially if this is the end of the thing, this ritual. Yeah. Like, whatever. (laughs) It got rained out. Yeah. (laughs) It rained once. We're not going to (laughs) reschedule (laughs) it. But we watch later as a casket is carried into a dark cemetery by two cloaked men. And as a church bell tolls, the narrator shares that the bells rang all night to keep away the spirits of evil. The casket is lowered into a grave, and we learn from the narrator that this is the body of Yavutich and that his coffin is covered in unconsecrated earth in a burying place reserved for murderers. But we then enter a crypt, lit only by the torches of cloaked men, learning from the narrator that the body of Asa the witch is buried here in the tomb of her ancestors. Her stone coffin rests on an altar, a section of its lid seemingly cut out, and a two-barred cross towering over it. We fade to black. See, this is for me right here. I was like, you guys fucking went and buried her in a crypt mm-hmm. built her this and was like oh no she's gonna like this 
and didn't even try to burn her again. That's no. for me. I was like, why you didn't? Why didn't you try the next night? I, or wait till it stopped raining or something? What's fun? And it is a pretty nice coffin too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to waste on someone you're like, I repudiate. Yeah. yeah. And well, again, you you're her brother, and you're like, you're not. You know, basically, you're not my family anymore. This is your crime. Yeah. I'm gonna bury you with my family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But when we fade back in to the clattering of horse hooves and the sight of bare trees, we get on-screen text reading two centuries later. That was a time jump I was not anticipating. Yeah, centuries. Two centuries later? Yeah. Wasn't expecting no. that. A horse-drawn carriage travels down a path, and Dr. Andre Gorobitz, played by John Richardson, leans his head out of the window to ask the coachman, played by Mario Passante, how much longer until they reach the crossroads at Mirgorod. I do want to point out that Mirgorod was the name of the collection of stories that V was published in in, in 1835. I love that. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah. I think it might actually be a city, but it's just a slight, a small little... Nod. Yeah. yeah. But the coachman, whipping the horses, answers that it's only six or seven births, and Andre settles back into the car and converses with Dr. Choma Kruvayan, played by Andrea Cecchi, telling him that if they stop at Mirgorod, they probably won't be able to reach Moscow by the evening. I do want to point out that Chechi was one of Mario Bava's closest friends. Oh, okay. <laughs> Kruvayan, leafing through the pages of a book, just says that it doesn't matter and that they can spend the night at an inn in Mirgorod to enjoy some smoked salmon and excellent vodka. Damn. Yum. Yeah. He's like, I've got my night plan. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually counting on it. Yeah. He looked at the menu ahead of time, yeah. which, which I fully endorsed. He pulled it up on Yelp. He's like, this looks yeah. great, dude. <laughs> But he assures Andre that they'll still be in time for Congress tomorrow. But Andre worries that they'll miss the opening address, reminding Kruvayan that Dr. Vestinov of St. Petersburg will be there, and Dr. Steiner of Vienna as well. Kruvayan just smiles, asking how long Andre has had his degree. And Andre replies that he's had it for three years, and he's been working with Kruvayan for two. Now, Kruvayan knows this. <laughs> yeah. I will say. No, that was for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's like, remember? Yeah. Well, he's like, how many times have you seen Dr. Steiner? He's a genetic <laughs> freak. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, plus, we only have a 33 and a third chance yeah. of seeing yeah. him. So, so what do you do with that? He's definitely not a math professor. No. <laughs> <laughs> But Kruvayan just remarks that when Andre has been in this profession as long as he has, he'll learn to take all of these conference speeches with a grain of salt. But as the stagecoach reaches a crossroad in the fog, Kruvayan calls out to the coachman, instructing him to take a shortcut through the forest. Now, this is definitely a good idea in a horror film. I would <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, always. Sure. Mm -hmm. The coachman informs Kruvayan that the road is full of holes and no one uses it anymore. Kruvayan understands this to mean that the coachman is afraid of the witch, which he's like, no, I'm going to fuck up my carriage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this is fair warning. Yes. And also a reminder to listen to the fucking locals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're like, no, go that way. No, we shouldn't. Okay, then we probably shouldn't. <laughs> you live here. I fucking don't. Yeah, he's the Uber in this neighborhood, dude. Exactly. Like, don't, he, he knows, knows it. Yeah. He's got it up on Google Maps. Like <laughs> he, he knows what he's doing. And I'm sorry, again, this, it's very funny to me, and it does speak a lot to Kruvai on how he just does not believe in any of this stuff, Yeah, yeah. but it's very telling, and he, mm, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the coachman admits that it isn't easy to frighten him, considering he fought through the war against Napoleon, but he says that he'd rather find himself face-to-face -face with a cursed Frenchman than to meet up with a ghost. Not against Napoleon. Yeah. I was like, God damn. It was personally them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a boss fight. <laughs> Kruvayan, with a gloved hand, tosses the coachman a coin, telling him that this will help him forget all about the ghosts. He urges the coachman to keep going, and the coachman, to his credit, thinks it over for a moment, staring down at the coin, and then decides to do as he's told and steer the horses towards the forest road. This and maybe I'm alone here, automatically made me not like Kruvayan. Yeah. It was such a, like, here, you fucking, you know what I mean? Like, you peasant. Yeah. Now, now you'll do it with this fucking shiny coin. <laughs> like, it felt, it, I, I was like, I, oh, I don't like that. No. Like, yeah. I did not like that. I think like it that. was a nickel. You know? I don't know. <laughs> He's like, I've got tons of these, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you, though. Mm. Mm, poor you. <laughs> 
But the score grows eerie and ominous as the stagecoach continues through the splintered and shadowy trees. Andre and Kruvayan watch through their windows, a wailing echoing in the distance. Andre asks fearfully what the sound is, but Kruvayan assures him that it's just the wind in the trees. It's just the evil, evil wind. <laughs> yeah. It's scary wind, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fine. You're fine, I promise. But the road we were on before didn't sound like that. Not, Not at, at all. all. Yeah. Interesting, when we enter the witch's wood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the trees are the, like the trees they kept talking about in Salem's Lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, you, now you've said these trees yeah. <laughs> too many times, this example, exact example. <laughs> But their conversation is interrupted by the coachman's startled scream as the stagecoach halts on the path. But the men lean out their heads, asking the coachman what happened, to which he reveals that the branches on one of the trees reached out and tried to choke him. Kruvayan, noticing the bottle that the coachman is holding, suggests that he tries not to choke himself on his vodka and orders him to keep going. Coachman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm on your side. Yeah. Yeah. The giant bottle of vodka does hurt your credibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you, and uh-huh. I'm on your team. Yeah. It's not a good look, Coachman. It it's was, not. It was very cartoony. It, it was, was a big. <laughs> he tried to hide. He tries to hide it in his jacket. Mm-hmm. Like, come on, dude. It was a choice. <laughs> and whether it's year two or year year two hundred, you're still drinking and driving, man. Yeah, I know. Two year horsepower t- or two hundred horsepower. <laughs> that's not like. They should have seen that and been like, well, that was we'll, brilliant. we'll yeah. take the next one. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a dude. We're fine. Never mind. <laughs> like, what's that sticking out of your jacket? Like, mm. <laughs> but we watch through jagged branches as the stagecoach disappears into the fog. They continue through the forest and towards Mirgorod, and Andre asks why the coachman is in such a hurry. Kruvayan attributes it to his tip and the coachman's fear, and the two men share a hearty laugh. They're it's like, he's terrified up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have the comforts of home. You guys suck. He literally, he tried to warn you. Mm-hmm. You forced him to go. And then you're like, why is he going so fucking like, fast? Yeah. Like, and now you're is roasting he him. Scared? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's so wild that he is so vulnerable up there. You're here. Yeah. I mean, I just, it's so cruel. It's fucked up. But hmm. continue because this made me laugh out loud. Yeah. <laughs> Almost in a moment of (laughs) instant karma, they take a very small dip to one side very slowly, but we see that one of the wheels of the stagecoach has come off before they've made it out of the forest completely. I laughed out loud at that transition, and I like that you said that they tilted very slowly. Yeah, they they did. (laughs) But just the transition of, ah, to, oh, good heavens. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's really funny to me because in the English dub, at least, Kruvayan just kind of goes, oh. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, that caught up to me pretty quick. It was, it's exactly what they get, but it did make me a little sad because it's not their stagecoach. Uh huh. You know what I mean? And he didn't deserve that. No. No. But that was, hilarious but the coachman laments the issue in this place of all places and assures the men that he'll have the wheel back on in no time at all the sound of wailing continues in the distance as andre and kruvayan stand at the side of the carriage andre remarks that it isn't very cheerful here acknowledging the eerie sound in the distance kruvayan makes note of the direction of the sound and encourages their investigation of it the coachman then downs a gulp of vodka from his bottle as soon as the men pass him by. So, <laughs> so you were right. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> At least he had the decency to you wait. Know, yeah. He waited yeah. a one second. Little... <laughs> yes, so one you... second out of sight. Look, see here, I get it. Uh-huh. I'm going to need a drink. We're in this haunted forest. My The wheel just came off my wagon. Yeah. What? And you guys are leaving me alone. Yeah, you just took off. Which maybe stay and help the guy <laughs> that needs help with the wheel. Mm-hmm. When the wheel broke, because he went the way that you forced him to go. Yeah, he's literally shaking in his boots, and you're like, "Let's leave this this yeah. fucker alone, right? <laughs> Come on, Andre. It's like, That's crazy." <laughs> but the men reach the ruins of what appears to be a stone crypt. Whales echoing all around them as they investigate deeper, and the camera glides around the cobweb decay of the structure. I will say, I heard on commentary, and I do recognize some parts of it, but these ruins were reused in the Virgilox segment of Black Sabbath. Okay. I, you <laughs> can, I can tell. Yeah. Like, that is very fucking cool, because I was like me like not every (laughs) creepy ass script looks the same you know what i mean but okay i feel validated yeah that's pretty cool (laughs) yeah 
But in the ruins, Kruvion stumbles upon an old pipe organ, attributing the sound that they've been hearing to the wind and the pipes. <laughs> he immediately strikes them with his cane and they clatter to the floor, the sound of which scares the hell out of the coachman who misaligns the wheel and causes the stagecoach to remain unrepaired. This was another thing. I laughed out loud. Why yeah. did you do that? <laughs> you, this isn't yours. That like, was so yeah. unnecessary. <laughs> He's, He's like, like is see? This, is this what was scaring you? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll solve that. But he calls out to Kruvayan, who tells him everything's fine and to just continue with his repairs. The men turn to head back towards the coachman, but they're interrupted by the sound of movement. They turn, and the camera zooms in on a door creaking open on its own, disturbed by the wind against a clutter of branches. Kruvayan crosses through the branches, Andre following him through the door, which leads to a staircase. The men head down through stone pillars, iron gates, and more cobwebs to find the Vida family crypt. I kept thinking how bad my allergies would be acting oh out if God. I went down there. I mean, I'll help the stagecoach guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the camera rotates around the scene, including the stone casket of Asavida and markers of her deceased ancestors, the tomb wearing the age of the two centuries since we last saw it. Kruvayan poetically remarks, more than a thousand years of conflicts, hates, and loves, all reduced to dust in these tombs. Great <laughs> yeah. line. I was like, God mm -hmm. damn. He says that nothing exists of the ancient princes of Vida but the dead shadows of their former glory, and that the history of ancient Moldovia is carved in these tombs. Andre surveys the expansive area as he and Kruvayan make their way over to the familiar stone coffin of Asa Vida. Kruvayan wipes the dust away from the window of Asa's casket, calling Andre over to explain the legend to him. He directs Andre's attention to the bronze mask on Asa's face, telling him that one was always placed over the face of a condemned witch so that she would always wear over her face her true face, the face of Satan. We see through the dingy window the mask of Satan, covered in cobwebs, and Andre asks why her casket has a window at all. Kruvayan explains that the townsfolk feared that the witch might rise again, so they wanted to always keep a cross visible to her, even in death, to keep her nailed down forever. They weren't taking any chances. Uh -huh. no. It was funny to me that we're going to build a glass-topped... <laughs> <laughs> casket instead of just burning, burning her? yeah <laughs> yeah you know the fire's right there you've had 200 years mm -hmm. and you're saying that you're afraid <laughs> yeah. yeah because the cross and the window are here <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm not that afraid <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but dude i understand having things on my to-do list that's like dude yeah we just didn't get to it yeah, yeah. For 200 years sometimes a week passes a month <laughs> 200 years it's you know it's subjective it's all relative i like this the design of it yes but like you're saying babe why <laughs> why would you have that still and even if that i'm seeing this mask is like oh i can touch that i gotta go like, yeah I, I don't need to be here. <laughs> yeah no that's okay it is pretty cool to look at though. it is it is but, <laughs> but andre remarks that the story is incredible but their history lesson is interrupted by the coachman who requests their help to repair the stagecoach begging the men not to leave him alone in this infernal place, which, yeah. Yeah, he's <laughs> fucking struggling out there. Yeah, he's like, I was the one who was afraid, yeah, remember? Yeah, and he's like, now teach me the history of this place. Yeah. <laughs> so start, you said the 17th century? <laughs> Kruvayan mulls it over for a moment before finally asking Andre to help the driver while he stays down here a little longer to look around. I'm telling you, dude, this guy sucks. <laughs> yeah. Andre is fine with this, admitting that he prefers it outside. He says not only is there more air out there, but it's a little gloomy down here. A little... <laughs> yeah. so I gotta be honest, man. Not my vibe. <laughs> it's a little sad. <sighs> Kruvayan just chuckles, wiping away more of the dust in the casket window as the camera pans past him and toward a shadowy corner of the crypt. There's just a free skull and bones just hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's been 200 years in its ruins, but it's like, were these ever buried? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, just throw them down there. Yeah. That was also on the yeah. to-do list right <laughs> after. <laughs> we'll burn the witch and we'll find a place for those bones. <laughs> it's just disrespectful. But out of the, <laughs> out of nowhere, a very large bat emerges from the shadows. 
literally the largest bat alive. Yeah. Was that Batman? I think so. Because that bat had its own social security number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was huge. Yeah. I think that was his organ over there, and that's why he's so <laughs> right. he's like, pissed dude, off. Keep your fucking hands to yourself. <laughs> Johann Sebastian Bat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he attacks Kruvaya. He, the bat. <laughs> it's a fucking. I, it's, yeah. No, it's it's Bruce Wayne. It's huge. <laughs> but he attacks Kruvaya. <laughs> <laughs> and after failed attempts to, to bat it away with his cane, Kruvaya just pulls out yeah. a pistol and shoots it. I look. I understand this film started in the 17th century. Now we're in the 19th century. They're talking about <laughs> war with Napoleon, but I was still surprised That's, that he just yeah. pulled out a gun. Yeah, that was the funniest fucking thing because he fights with the bat <laughs> for a while with this cane. Yeah. And he's just like, what the fuck is it? Like a pest. Yeah. He's yeah. Not, he's not like, oh my God. He's just like, get the fuck away from me. Then he's like, oh, fuck this. Pulls out the gun. I was like, he's full brought a heater. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? You and know, Kruvayan keeps that thing yeah. on him. We what? never see this again. <laughs> no. Oh, oh, not at I, all. I will say. <laughs> but it is just funny. You're right. He's never like, well, this bad is <laughs> the biggest He's not worried about rabies. No. no, no nothing. nothing. He's just like, it comes with the territory. Yeah. You, you investigate an ancient tomb, you're going to fight a giant <laughs> bat. Yeah. Yeah. Giant bat. He knew. It's just part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but after he shoots the bat, it falls dying onto Asa's casket. And cr- <laughs> Kruvayan proceeds to beat the hell out of it indiscriminately. And in his bashings, he not only destroys the cross towering over Asa's casket, but he shatters the glass window covering Asa's masked face. Well, now you've fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Like, it just, and you were just told, I understand not believing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Even if you were looking at this from a purely like scientific standpoint this is historical yeah Yeah. and you just (laughs) took your big ass cane (laughs) and wrecked shop yeah he has destroyed so many things yeah you're bashing the fucking (laughs) organ (laughs) like this is it's too much that's why that giant ass bat (laughs) yeah he came after yeah (laughs) he's security (laughs) yeah he's like that's enough but when the dust finally settles andre returns in a hurry to check on his mentor because he heard a gunshot and Kruvian explains that this monster attacked him, <laughs> as he says, for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I think Christian Bale's down yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Andre finds it very strange, considering that bats usually shy away from human beings. He suggests they head outside. Otherwise, the coachman will be convinced that he's right to be scared. I will say there is like a portion of an old CPR video that I used to teach and it was part of the first aid course where they were talking about rabies Mm -hmm. and they were like, if you ever encounter a bat or find (laughs) yourself in a room with a bat, I was like, fine. (laughs) In what circumstance? Well, maybe you guys were both auditioning for the same part. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's a couple chairs down. He's like, switch with me. I'm nervous. (laughs) Um, But (laughs) when I worked at Target, when I was like 19, a bat flew in there. I was working at night and everybody was like, oh my God, that bat was not bothered he was not this big no, no. <laughs> he no. wasn't bothering anybody he i don't know how he got in there but yeah. he was just like in the corner well the doors are automatic yeah oh, all right. <laughs> he stepped on the little mat yeah, he's like, so Sweet. he's got a right to be there so he i, the I did find myself in a room with a bat i mean uh-huh. i guess it is possible and he didn't bash him with your cane. Yeah. i didn't bash him with anything <laughs> but Kruvayan reaches into the shattered window of the casket retrieving a triptych artifact opening it and handing it over to andre so according to Tim Lucas on the commentary, mm-hmm. it is St. George at the center of this triptych icon. Okay. And we learn that Asa was put to death on the day of the Feast of St. George, which apparently falls between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, which is where we get the title, Black Sunday. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I just All thought right. it sounded cool. I didn't it know. It does yeah. sound cool. All right. So George Foreman. Sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a like it's him in the middle, and then on both sides are grills. <laughs> 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 one's a grill, and one's a boxing glove. <laughs> Doesn't he have two sons named also George? I believe so. Uh, yes. Maybe it's all three Georges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Kruvayan then decides to wrench the mask off of Asa's face, and after some disgusting squelching noises, 
he reveals her spike-marked visage, her face almost the same as it was 200 years ago, except for two vacant holes in her eye sockets where bugs and scorpions crawl in and out. This looked great. Mm-hmm. Um, but why the fuck would you do that? Yes, yes, please. Why would yeah. you <laughs> peel the mask off of that? That's that's my comment. Why, though? He's like, while well, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already destroying everything. <laughs> I might as well. And I killed what? a bat today. Yeah. One more. <laughs> but you told me about the history of this place. Yeah. You told me why that mask is there. You know why that mask is there. But, and again, I think it just can, goes down to him just not believing in any of this. I, I feel like, okay, and I am very, uh, I believe in everything. You know what I mean? I would not fuck with this because I feel like... You don't fuck with shit like this and not expect something to get attached to you or even karmically something right, like right. this is desecration. Mm-hmm. But that that's what I'm going to say. Even if you don't believe in a supernatural element, this is still like that is a corpse. That's yeah. a body. Like, I feel like even if you don't think something supernatural is going to happen to you, you probably shouldn't. You probably wouldn't do that. I mean, right. Is history. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Clap I, if you would do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not Wendy Williams. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> um, that's when we see the mask. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but then let's get those people from the mummy over here. Where's my team to come dig this yeah, yeah, up? Yeah. And, uh, you, know? you know what I mean? Yeah. And again, what? Why? What? What is this? I don't know. I think this it's is I, not why y'all are here. I think it's a matter of just pure curiosity. One thing I will say is that I understand that it's Dr. Kruvayan. Yes. Do not know what his expertise <laughs> is. No. <laughs> I don't know if it's anthropology. It seems medical from what we see later. Yes, yeah. it, it's definitely medical. <laughs> and if it were something pertaining to this, wouldn't he be? Wouldn't he be knowledgeable? Yeah, you would think because he's just like smashing shit with his skin and being like, "Now what was this that I just broke?" You know? Yeah, but even that, if she still looks the same too, but the eyes, you're a medical doctor, yes. you know that's not possible. Yeah. That should not be. Yeah, it never becomes much of a thing. It should, <laughs> but. He's more just like kind of just I wanted to see what it looked yeah, like. Yeah. I like, cool mask now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm taking this with me. <laughs> oh, it's a collector's item. <laughs> but Kruvayan remarks that her face is still intact after two centuries. And Andre notices that Kruvayan has cut himself on the glass. I will say again, he just remarks this. He isn't like, this is a medical marvel. Yeah. This is, you know. No. Yeah, but Andre's like she's kind of hot though, right? Yeah. <laughs> if I saw someone yeah. like that, yeah, but like with the but eyes, yeah. fuck, dude, <laughs> that'd be it for me. I, I'd fall in love immediately. I think <laughs> over the course of one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but considering he's cut himself on the glass, Kruvayan just shrugs it off as just a drop of blood or two. <laughs> <laughs> but he gets lost in the gaze of Oz's empty eyes, convinced that she's somehow looking at them both. The door on the second floor then opens on its own, smashing against the wall. And Kruvayan admits that maybe it's time for them to leave. <laughs> <laughs> you what? have wrecked the place. Yeah, yeah, I love that even this place is like, get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> the camera rises above the two men as they make their exit. But in Asa's casket, we see Kruvayan's blood drip down the edge of a sharp piece of glass and into Asa's opened eye. But outside, as thunder crackles and lightning flashes... The men make their way out of the crypt and into the fog of night. This lightning flashing through the clouds was actually a matte painting done by Baba himself. Oh, nice. He does so much and he does not have credit for it in the film. And so it's just like reading thing after thing after thing. You're like, oh, he did that too? That's really cool. That's incredible. But they venture past the ruins, but stop when they notice the silhouette of a woman standing right there at the entrance. The light slowly reveals her to be Katya Vida, played by Barbara Steele. In a dual role this evening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I this and the way okay, she is holding two dogs on a leash. Yes. She is dressed all in black with mm-hmm. like a cloak or a cape. Yes. I I'm like, oh, she's already back to life. Yeah. Yes. That's my first thought. Yeah. Well, sh- it's it's Barbara Steele. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Both of them. We saw her at the beginning. Mm-hmm. The blood just, we all fucking, we're, we know horror. We know what yeah. the blood means. Mm-hmm. You knock the cross over. You know what I mean? Like, of course we think that. Yeah, that's what I thought too. I was like, oh, damn, she's already up. Yeah. I thought it's a very interesting misdirection as it goes yeah. on. Yeah. 
but she asks the men who they are and what they want. Kruvion introduces himself, as does Andre, who says his name very slowly for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Katya explains that she was walking in the park when she heard a gunshot, and she asks what happened. And Kruvion says that they just killed a large bat inside the crypt. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, you should have seen it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Andre apologizes for entering the chapel at all, explaining that they thought it was an abandoned ruin. He tells the incredibly well-lit Katya that they just wanted to satisfy their curiosity, acknowledging the strange and mysterious atmosphere of the ruins. Katya remarks that everything is going to ruin, but her father, Prince Vida, refuses to repair any of it. To him, she says, this place is a curse. The dogs then suddenly bark loudly as the coachman shouts to the men that the wheel is repaired and they can leave. He's like, please! Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Say thanks for nothing, by the way. I asked for help like 30 minutes ago. Yeah, it's been some time. (laughs) Kruvayan apologizes to Katya, telling her that they must go and they have five births still until they reach Mirgorod. Andre reveals that they're spending the night there, but he tells her that if she doesn't mind, he won't say goodbye to her because perhaps they will meet again. Andre, please. <laughs> Gotta shoot a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Kruvayan smiles almost as if to say, that is the slickest line I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. In my life. <laughs> but Katya smiles as well, replying that she trusts that they'll spend a good night in Mirgorod. As thunder rumbles and a romantic piano plays in the score, the men pass by Katya, Andre sharing quite a bit of eye contact with her, and Katya's eyes shimmer as they turn to meet his gaze. Andre turns in her direction again before joining Kruvion in the stagecoach, as if it wasn't clear already that he's deeply in love. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, Helplessly. Dude, he leans his head out of the window. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> like, <God. laughs> as the stagecoach departs, and Katya just gets smaller and smaller in the distance, and it's it's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kruvayan jokes that Andre is spellbound, but Andre only acknowledges the sadness in Katya's eyes. But in their hasty exit, Andre only just now realizes that he's still holding the triptych from Asa's tomb. Kruvayan takes it from him, putting it into his bag and calling it a souvenir of the witch. <laughs> Why was he like, it's mine! <laughs> <laughs> He's like, in my defense, I did find it first. (laughs) Who got cut? Who got cut? I bled for this. (laughs) But we watch as the stagecoach continues down the path, but the camera then pans across the forest, finding the yawning entrance of the crypt yet again, until we're taken down to the tomb below. Aza's crumbled casket still rests on the altar, and we zoom into the shattered window. Aza's face rests there motionless, but Kruvayan's blood bubbles in her vacant eye socket. This looked gross. Very. Mm-hmm. It looked creepy. Mm-hmm. It was very, very cool and effective. Yeah. I am always unnerved by this when I see it. Right. Mm-hmm. Tim Lucas did say that it was a combination of jelly and wax. Okay. Just rising up in the socket. I mean, yeah. wax is coming in clutch for yeah, this. Yeah, <laughs> For real. <laughs> I will say that this is also one thing that is used in Lamberto Bava's Demons. Okay. With this idea of a mask and blood being used to... Mm, Yeah. Okay. So this is where the homage was born from. Okay. Yeah. But in the salon of the Vida Castle, Katia plays the piano, lit softly by a candelabra resting on the lid. It is very interesting in this version of the film that we watched and in the Italian version. Uh-huh. She's playing her own love theme from when she met Andre on the piano that we heard in the score. Mm. Oh, okay. And so it's kind of showing that there is this attraction that she felt as well. Yeah. In the American AIP version, she plays like a funeral dirge, I heard. God. <laughs> Which is like, <laughs> what happened today? Yeah. Are, you, are you okay? <laughs> But um, I just I want to call this out because I love her outfits in this film. Yes. Yeah. Her costumes are beautiful. Yes, they are. I read that the costume designer was Tina Grani, who also worked with Mario Bava on Blood in Black Lace. Okay. Which had yes. some fucking yeah. fire fits. It was well. a fashion house. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like her work is amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you said she's playing the piano? 
Because that's shit's going off. Yeah. What, what I will say is that the syncing of the sound does not match what she's playing. Yeah. At least in the version we saw with the dub. But it looks like she knows how to play the piano. Yeah. It does. It looks like she is playing this. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, damn, she's tearing it up. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah. It was like uh, Vera Farmiga. Yeah. And we were like, dude, she's doing yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the camera glides past her and over to Constantine Vida, her brother, played by Enrico Olivieri, who stands by the fire cleaning a rifle. We settle in on an incredibly and intricately designed stone fireplace, which bears the sigil of a griffin carved into it, a painting on either side of the fireplace, one of a man in black and the other of a woman. So I did notice that you said uh, the John Constantine was here. <laughs> now, is this when he was younger, right? This is an origin story. <laughs> okay, all right. We got Batman. We've got Constantine. <laughs> yeah. So JP's moving his score up a point. Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> but in front of the fireplace, we find an older man resting in a chair, warmed by the flames. This is Prince Vida, the father of Katya and Constantine, played by Ivo Garani. I was like, what is this? Dad is just vibing by the fireplace. Yeah. Son is cleaning a gun. Daughter's playing the piano. Yeah. <laughs> just a chill <laughs> night. Just like family things, yeah. I guess. Family things. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are they doing? Uh, having a night, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, my thing is, I, if I'm not mistaken, because I could not find a credit for the Prince Vida who put Asa to death, except for Ivo Garani. Mm. Okay. And this Prince Vida, 200 years later, Ivo Karani. Okay. Oh, right. So it's more than one person playing a dual role in this yeah. film. And he is aged with makeup and things in his hair. On commentary, Tim Lucas said that he was 38 years old. What? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I thought this was just an older man. Well, it was convincing. Yeah. Because, yeah, I didn't realize that at all. Me neither. Uh. I do want to call out the just the design of the sets of this castle mm -hmm. it is so amazing all the props all of the stonework it's just so beautiful to look at mm -hmm. the paintings on the walls that i said earlier were painted by mario bava uh, God <laughs> damn. Oh, yeah. yeah again just a busy man <laughs> well i mean it looks great yeah mm -hmm. And the production designer who designed all of these sets and also designed an incredible graveyard set that we saw a little bit of, but we'll see much more later, mm -hmm. was Giorgio Giovannini, who was also the art director for Black Sabbath and The Girl Who Knew Too Much. But he also worked with Robert Aldrich, Federico Fellini, and Terry Gilliam. Damn. Yeah. All right. A massive career. Yeah. yeah. But suddenly... Katya stops playing the piano when she hears an odd noise, which she describes as a voice breaking off. Don't like that? No. <laughs> Not at all. The sound continues even louder, and we get a tight shot of Prince Vida's fearful face. But Constantine recognizes this sound as the howling of wolves, and he says that he finally understands why he couldn't find any wild deer in the forest on his hunt today. Prince Vida rises from his chair, disagreeing with his son's assessment, telling him that those sounds are not wolves. But he's startled when he peers over at a familiar painting on the wall. It's the woman on the left, and we see that the painting is of Asa Vida, and he notices that a griffin is painted in the corner that wasn't there before. Well, that's concerning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he calls out to his children, and Katya agrees that the painting has changed. Constantine remarks that this painting has always had a strange effect on Katya, and he wonders why. I can guess <laughs> why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we immediately cut to the painting. This edit made me laugh out loud because it's clearly Katya's exact double. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why are you so weird around this thing, dude? <laughs> but Katya just says that it's like a flame that she can't escape. She says there's something alive about it. Something different about the eyes and the hands and the painting, as if the painting were hiding something. She admits that sometimes she can't even go near it. Let's put this painting in storage. Let's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Her dad's like, well, that's where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Go to your room. <laughs> but though he was the one who caused all of this worry and concern, Prince Vida softly scolds Katya, telling her that maybe Constantine is right and the painting hadn't changed at all. 
He turns to walk away, but readjusts his coat, remarking how cold it is in the room. He then realizes that the cold seems to be coming out of the fireplace tonight and penetrating into his bones. Now, this is a horrible and horrifying thing to hear your father say. Yeah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was say, I don't know if it's because my dad is so chill yeah. and he's not like... Him being like, it's in my bone. Like, I'd be like, Dad, where do what we are go? You what are we about? <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, whatever. <laughs> Calm down, Dad. <laughs> but one thing to consider as well is this is a very, very, very subtle foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. We learn so much about this fireplace that is set up in this line right here. Okay. Bacatia suggests that he gets some sleep as he must be very tired. But Prince Vida insists that he's not tired, but his spirit is. <laughs> yeah, that's really upset. Yeah. <laughs> still, I still think sleep would be. Yeah. <laughs> but he suggests his children get some sleep instead as he wishes to be alone. Katya curtsies in front of him as he kisses her forehead, and then Constantine walks over to him too and bows his head for a forehead kiss. Well, he was kind of like, be gone. Yeah. <laughs> I, it did make me laugh that Constantine's like, I'm not putting any effort into this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Katya was kind enough to curtsy, but just kiss my forehead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but after his children leave, Prince Vida walks over to the piano and presses a single key. It made me laugh because it's not connected at all, but the second he pressed the button, the servant walked in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it does seemingly summon even a servant played by Tino Bianchi, He has a tray with a glass on it, and he sets it on the dining room table. He bids the prince good night, but Vida stops him, and he asks Even to confirm that he's served this house for many years, to which Even replies that he was actually born here. Vida reminds him that today is the Feast of St. George, and says that Even must know the legend of the curse that was placed on this castle. He says that two centuries ago, today, two people were executed for practicing witchcraft, and we see their portraits presiding over them on the wall, Princess Asa and her accomplice, Prince Yavutic. Vida says that to their faces was nailed the mask of Satan, and 100 years later, on St. George's Day, an earthquake destroyed the ancient chapel, and the witch's tomb was found split opened, as if Asa had broken out to exact her revenge. They've repaired it since then. I was <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> But no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the prince shares that that very night, Princess Masha died mysteriously. He says that Masha was beautiful, the very image of Asa, and she was only 21 years old. And it hits him, the same age of Katya. And Katya is Masha's living image. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not. And there's no way she looks more like Masha than yeah, <laughs> Masa. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, are we just putting this together? He's but like, Hold that's on. literally a painting of your daughter on the wall that she <laughs> yeah. feels weird around. Unless all the, the girls in the family just look the same. They're uh-huh. just clones. They're just carbon copies. Yeah, it's like, why do me and Aunt Stacy look the same? It's, it's like, like, that's it's just her. how our family yeah. is. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> get past it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because your kid's going to look like that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Vida's eyes dart around the room as he remarks that it's as if the witch torments her victims with her own beauty before killing them. He admits that this resemblance, this repeating of Asa's vengeance, terrorizes and strikes fear into him. Even seems unbothered, though, reminding the prince that he's protected by the cross, and even if what he's saying is true, these monsters are fearful of the sacred symbol of Christ. He urges the prince to always have a cross near him, and he'll always be safe. Vida agrees, attributing this fearful feeling to the atmosphere of the day, and even just suggests that the prince drink the toddy that he brought him before it gets cold. Even hands the glass to the prince, who holds it in both hands, but gazes up at Aza's portrait before taking a drink. He then brings the cup up to his lips, but stops dead in his tracks when reflected in the rippling liquid is the mask of Satan. Not in my beverage. Yeah. <laughs> it was too strong. Yeah. <laughs> it looks it looks incredible. Yeah. Yes, it does. I read that this was an homage to 1932's White Zombie. 
Okay. And so you, again, you're wearing influences and influence others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Influencing <laughs> others. Too. I'm sorry. You're, you influence yeah. others. You're, you turn into a lynx. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, wow, I want to do that. I've <laughs> been there. I think that would be cool to do. <laughs> So these are also <laughs> called Southern cough syrup toddies. Oh yeah, I was like, that's yeah, people still drink. I just it makes me think of um, King of the Hill when Buck Strickland was drinking them. Yeah, <laughs> I was, I was, he was uh, a little forceful with his. Because yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, I was like, I know I've heard that before. So yeah, I, I looked it up and then I seen that and I was like, what the hell? It's just a mixed drink. Yeah, it, it's got yeah, it's got alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like just fucking go to bed <laughs> just drink your drink well you remember uh zodiac he, he offered them one too that's yeah. right yeah but upon seeing the mask of satan in his drink which i don't think he even put in there <laughs> <laughs> vita drops the glass trembling that he just saw death and he thinks that it's an omen he declares that they won't win they cannot win against the symbol of christ this scene is immediately over, and we cut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. That's it. That's all we got. <laughs> we cut to the ruins of the chapel, wind whistling around until the camera settles on the entrance once again, finding its way to Oz's tomb. In the broken window of her coffin, two eyes like glowing orbs appear in her sockets, returning to her as new flesh surrounds them. So like an Uncle Frank situation. I mean. Okay, yeah. yeah. I was like, let her cook. Yeah. <laughs> She's working on it. She'll need those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will say they had talked about it on commentary, the motif of eyes in general, because it comes up so often. Mm -hmm. You have the eyes of Asa. You have the eyes of Katya. You have something that happens later as a means of destruction for these monsters. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And the eyes of the mask, how we saw through it. Yeah. yeah. It comes up quite often. But at the Mirgorod Inn, there is a lively dance afoot with music and cavorting couples. Kruvayan and Andre sit at a table together drinking vodka. The innkeeper, played by Clara Bindi, checks on them and Kruvayan assures her that they don't need anything else. Andre is absolutely drunk. Yeah, yes. I was going to say, maybe <laughs> just Andre's drinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And he pours himself another drink, and he says that he feels as though he could conquer the world. Kruvayan assumes that he'll start with the castle, as someone there made quite an impression on him. All right. <laughs> Andre says that with another drink or two, that's exactly where he'd go. But as he rises from his chair and downs another drink, Kruvayan tells him that he would be wiser to go to sleep, retorting that mysterious princesses are more easily conquered in dreams. <laughs> yeah, that would be a terrible idea. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he reminds Andre that they have to be up early tomorrow, and Andre reluctantly retires to bed, Kruvayan telling him of his plans to take a walk for the night and then set up a wake-up call at 5 a.m. There's nothing better than fucking around with some ancient evil and mm -hmm. then taking a nice night walk. <laughs> yeah. Alone. Yes. Alone. Yeah. Alone. Through a dark forest. Yeah. <laughs> But they say their goodnights to each other, and before he heads upstairs, Andre suggests that Kruvayan watch out for bats on his walk. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Kruvayan considers another glass of vodka, but he decides against it. Near to the door of the inn, the innkeeper scolds Sonia, her daughter played by Germania Dominici. She's the daughter of the actor who plays Yevutic. Oh, okay. that's very cool. Yeah. But as the scolding continues, the innkeeper stops Kruvayan as he walks by and asks him if it's absurd that a girl as big as Sonia is afraid to go alone to milk the cow in the barn. Pulling in a complete stranger to shame your <laughs> yeah, daughter is crazy. That. <laughs> That's crazy, He's dude. like, anyone will do you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Isn't He's she like, ridiculous? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, she's a pussy. He's yeah. like, what do you, you, you want? He's like, I got to go. I'm not here yeah. for that. <laughs> That's crazy. I will say that was very surprising because I almost thought she was going to be like, look, Sir, can you go with my yes, daughter? Yeah. Take, make sure she gets to the barn. Look, yeah. there's an adult or whatever. Like, Isn't she ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. It's your child. And why um, do we typically do that at night? I feel like yeah. that is a daytime activity. I've yeah, never no, met the cow. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. All right. And somebody get Pearl on the line. <laughs> don't get Pearl on the line. <laughs> <laughs> but when asked, Kruvayan agrees with the innkeeper. <laughs> Even after Sonia shares that the barn is right next to the old cemetery. Dude. 
<laughs> Look, and I'm not doing that. Yeah, no. at my big age, a haunt. I gotta go milk a haunted cow. <laughs> oh no, no, wait, no, no. the cow's a ghost. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Kruvayan tells her that she mustn't be afraid of the dead as they sleep very soundly. And he makes a hasty exit. He's like, unless you get blood on them. And yeah. then all bits are up. <laughs> <laughs> the innkeeper gives Sonia the pail and tends to her customers. Sonia saying that she'll do it tonight, but she's not doing it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you got one, mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> But she heads outside where she finds Kruvayan smoking his pipe. I will say the sign on the building in Russian says Gastonitsa, which translates to hotel. And it's a word that I knew. Hey, hey, hey good you for go. you. I was very proud. I told Jules they were very proud of me, too. Very nice, man. <laughs> Thank you. But the camera follows Sonia as the voices from the inn grow distant and trees surround her in the dark. She makes her way through the branches, trembling in fear as she spots a toad but rushes as fast as she can for the barn. I really love this shot that follows her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very, I don't know, it just it feels very foreboding. And you remember what it's like to be a kid. Yeah. And be fucking terrified of having to like, you know, oh, go to the go to the basement or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We never like, had no, a basement. No, but <laughs> still, no. No, we're not doing that. Well, we had the thing that kind of like in. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude. In the apartment building in Germany, it was like everybody had a little old storage unit. And okay. what movie is that like? Annabelle? Yeah, it was like it's that. It's like that. All right, all right. That was the scariest fucking. Like yeah. I can still yeah. remember how it smelled down First there. First of all, it was, <laughs> it was a, traumatizing. Yeah, it was a flickering light. Yes, okay. it was literal like cages. Yes, yeah. for people to hold their things, and we had to go milk cows down there. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we had right next to the haunted yeah, cemetery. Yeah, that's where we kept our cows to milk them. <laughs> At least you guys had a flickering light. My mom's basement, there's no light down there. Your mom's basement is fucking scary oh, because yeah. it's, almost, it's almost like you're going down a secret passage to get down there. Well, because it was a storm cellar. Oh. So when my mom added on to the house, she built over it but made a room to go down into it like a basement uh-huh so like you have to go into my mom's closet yeah then there's a secret closet oh. yes. open <laughs> to go into the basement i was like is she bringing me down here to kill me <laughs> <laughs> it's like joe pesci walking into that room yes. yeah. <laughs> it's like fuck, oh, fuck dude. <laughs> but sonia greets their cow irena once inside the barn, setting down a stool to begin the task at hand. Kruvayan also makes it through the trees, but he finds a small pond and he tosses a rock into it. On commentary, this was explained as a metaphor, like a metaphoric visual of the drop of blood into Asa's eye. Oh! Okay. I was like, that's just brilliant. Yeah. yeah. All right. But the pond fades into an overhead shot of Asa Vida's coffin, her eyes fully opened and returned to her, and her face still carrying the punctures of the mask of Satan. I did want to say, I meant to mention it at the top, with the visual of that mask being pounded into her face. Mm -hmm. This was very graphic in the film that we see, Yeah, but it was apparently meant to be even more graphic in the storyboards. And they were going to show the mask not only penetrating into her face, but smashing through the stake Ooh. behind her. Oh, damn. Through the back of her skull. Yeah. And so it was going to be much worse, but I guess they had some second thoughts, which is fine. <laughs> or they were probably like, that's enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when you think about what they did show, I did read it's 1960. At least in the UK, Psycho had been released the week before. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Talk yeah. about context. Yeah. yeah. And when you think about how they had to cut the shower scene yeah. and put all these edits and splices to where you feel like you saw more than you did. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, in Black Sunday, we watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just very interesting. But Asa's voice echoes and her eyes glow as she calls out, Rise, Yavutich. Yavutich, rise. We then see lightning flash and thunder crackle over the old cemetery. They had discussed on commentary how they did like, because you can see her eyes are almost like these bright pinholes. Mm -hmm. What they did is they had her look away from the lighting and they literally just shined pinhole lights into the whites of her eyes. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it looks, it looks frightening, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Frankly. 
(laughs) (laughs) But the wind howls over the cemetery as the camera pulls back through the trees to find Yavutich's resting place. We then hear Arena moo as the camera snaps towards the barn. Here's the thing, guys. Like, I thought Sonia might be exaggerating. Yeah. This barn oh, is no. in the cemetery. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, this barn is just part of the cemetery. Yeah. So I don't know what her mother is doing. <laughs> Who knows? She's like, stop being a little bitch. Get out there. <laughs> it's like, mom, I'm a child. Yeah. I am. I am scared. <laughs> scary as fuck. And it's a walk. Yeah. yeah. But Sonia soothes the cow as the storm grows stronger outside. She peers through an opening in the wooden slats before continuing her work. But the camera travels back toward that opening, where the grave of Yavutich pulses, a mound of dirt cracking as fog and wind rise around it. The grave cracks open as thunder rumbles and lightning flashes, and Yavutich's long dead hands gain purchase on the splintered dirt, and he pulls himself out of the ground, still wearing the mask of Satan and his tattered attire from the night that he was put to death. He lurches like a zombie, his arms outstretched as he travels through the fog. He then tears the mask from his face, emitting a sound of relief as he continues through the night. He came to life. Yeah. Good for him. I mean, so he's um, free. That's a good thing though, right? I mean, for I him. Mean, yeah. 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 But I was Just like, him. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of forgot about him. Like, I feel like he's such a footnote in what is going on. Yeah. It's like really all about her. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh shit. Okay. Yeah. Because didn't we find him dead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The first scene he yeah. already was masked. Yeah. I I love this sequence so much. The beginning of it is just one continuous shot. Mm-hmm. The thing about it is that they wanted to film this entire thing in one continuous take, but you do see they cut away to the barn for a moment. Yeah. And it's because every single time they filmed this under the hot studio lights, Dominici kept passing out. Oh my god. <laughs> and so they're like, okay, maybe we can we can find a way to not. Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that you said every time they tried, because they were like, all right, do it yeah. again. Get him up, prop him up, do it again. That's <laughs> like, crazy. Before they're like, okay, fine, we'll cut away. Uh, yeah. We're out of smelling salts. Yeah. So <laughs> you gotta make a choice, Mario. The thing about it, though, is I know that we were talking a little bit vaguely about what we had heard as far as Barbara Steele and her kind of reputation on set. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dirt being thrown around on both sides. Yeah. A lot of interviews and stories that believe what you want. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that were mentioned by the actress who plays Sonia, because this is her father in this costume. Okay. Is that the reason that he kept passing out is because he had to stay in this costume for so long because they were waiting for Barbara Steele to get on set for different things. Mm. (laughs) And so he's waiting so he can film this part in the studio and it just keeps happening. And she was the one who was quoted as saying, what does she think she's Marilyn Monroe? Jeez. I'll be honest. I'm only gonna watch my dad pass out. So no, many yeah, times. I was gonna say <laughs> before you're like, where is she? Yeah. <laughs> before I'm gonna start to hold a grudge. <laughs> I don't blame her no. for being this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I really don't think enough can be said about this sequence. The sound, the angles, the camera placement, the movement. Mm-hmm. It you can see influences of Frankenstein. Yeah. But you wonder how much this could have possibly influenced the movement of reanimated corpses. That's yeah. true. In yeah. films, you know? But we cut to the fireplace in Prince Vida's bedroom, pulling back from it as pensive music sounds in the score. And this is the one that I was like, I'm pretty sure this was in Blood and Black Lace. <laughs> <laughs> but we find the prince lying in his bed, tossing and turning awake as a wolf howls outside. He rises up and the camera glides to his bedroom door where the handle is lit by a slice of light. We then travel around the room, guided by a foul wind from a secret door opened behind the fireplace, which causes the fire to rise before being snuffed out. So there's your payoff. Yes. Yeah. It's like, that's why it was so cold. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But the sheet music is blasted from the piano and the curtains are whipped around violently. Several suits of armor also clatter to the floor. (laughs) I just thought of Blood and Black Lace, of course. Yeah. 
that look, I get it. You're trying to scare me or whatever's <laughs> going on here. And last you're gonna pick this shit up, ghost. Literally. Yeah, I don't. We have a problem. Yeah, I was like, please stop that. <laughs> Vita's like, even yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two hot tatties. <laughs> <laughs> But the prince struggles to catch his breath in bed as he peers down a long hall, chairs toppling over on their own. But then, suddenly, his bedroom door opens and lit through the darkness is the dead face and focused eyes of Yavutich. He lurches forward through shadows as Vida cowers in his bed, the flames catching the texture of Yavutich's decayed flesh. Now, I will say this begins the zooms a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, it, it's, it has to punctuate what's going exactly. on. Exactly. Yes. It sells the moment. Yeah. It's, you feel Vida's fear. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. But Vida remembers the cross on his bedside table, and upon seizing it, he holds it out in front of himself, crying out to Yavutich. Yavutich shields his eyes, and in a series of really awesome snap zooms, as I said, yeah. <laughs> he makes a very hasty retreat, leaving the door swaying on its hinges. So that cross did have extra corners. It did. But it worked. Yes. Yeah. I did try to look up this cross specifically. Yeah. Because there is like a difference to what we are used to seeing when we think of a cross. Right. And I did see that the, this variant is sometimes called the patriarchal cross. Okay. Mm. Sometimes it's called the cross of Lorraine. And I believe it's very similar as well to the Russian Orthodox cross too. Lorraine okay. Warren? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why they named it. It's after her. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Put it into terms I can understand. No. Sorry. <laughs> it was Lorraine Warren designed it. Yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> and I want to say as well, the fact that Yavutich wasn't buried in the family crypt proves further to me. True. Yeah. That they're not related. Yeah. They're not related. I'm just confused as to where anyone got that. Because yeah. I'm like, did I miss that? I didn't get that at all. Me neither. Well, but we were told that her brother's the one who killed her. And yeah. yeah. So and their last name is Vida. Yeah. As we've clearly stated, his, <laughs> <laughs> his surname is Yavutich. Yes. <laughs> so I don't. I don't get that. And I understand there is. Yes, there is a painting of him on the wall. Yeah. But I wonder if it's because he's Prince Yavutich and she's Princess Asa. They are history of this family. Right. Yeah, but it is funny that they have that up in the living room. Like, no, <laughs> for 200 years, nobody's taken that down. And it's really fucking funny that after whatever they feel disgraced or whatever, they're like, but we have to yeah. honor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they but were. She was my sister. They were here first. It's, <laughs> it's right. sweet. We you should do remember look them. like Aunt Becky. Yeah. 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 Well, um, just, <laughs> just leave it. They worked very hard. Those paintings were expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But after Yavutich's retreat, in a matter of seconds, Constantine rushes in with a lantern to check on his father, with Katya following close behind him. About fucking time. Yeah. <laughs> Suits of armor are fucking crashing. There's yeah. an evil wind in the house. Like, y'all, you took your time. They're hot sleepers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Even joins them as well. But Prince Vida just cries out in fear in his bed without an answer. Katya says that they have to find a doctor and remembers that she met two doctors today in front of the chapel and that they're at the inn in Mirgorod. They summon Boris, a stable hand played by Renato Terra, and ask him to find the doctors at once. And some hot toddies. Yeah. <laughs> That's about four hot toddies. <laughs> But the way she said it, I was, I kind of, again, I thought earlier, even when she was like, look, I'm from here, that that was the witch. Yeah. So I was like, oh, so that's you just out there looking scary and shit. Yeah. Like, I love the goth look. We all do. Yeah. But like, I didn't, what, you snuck up on us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those two scary she, ass dogs. Uh -huh. She was like, I met two very nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think one's in love with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll come he'll, yeah. he'll, he'll be trust here. me trust me you'll be fine dad <laughs> <laughs> but we cut to Sonia cowering in the forest after a successful job done she watches through the trees as a dark and ghostly horse-drawn carriage appears to pass her by in slow motion it rides silently through the night and disappears into a thick fog this is amazing Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very surprised that she had started a character on Stay Alive. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth what? Bathory. I was going to say, so is Elizabeth Bathory <laughs> in there? <laughs> I, 
I yes. <laughs> it does look it cool does. though. It does. <laughs> I I just I love again. There's so much imagery in this film that is just so brilliant. Yeah. This is one that's gonna stay with you. Yeah. The design of that carriage, the silhouette of these horses. Yes. The fog. What is it so scary about horse-drawn carriages? It's like, dude, that's the. The most frightening shit. Yeah, you see like a van or a car roll by. You're just like, man, what the fuck? Those windows are tinted or whatever. <laughs> if I see some <laughs> some dark fucking black horses, yeah, you know what I mean? And then a, a fucking super black carriage just creeping. Oh, no, I'm going inside. Absolutely well, not. Yeah, no. It, partially because it's 2024. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't but, be happening. But I think at any time, this is frightening. Yeah. yeah especially if you don't have a rose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fuck. You're fucked. Or 12 roses or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Since they really <laughs> just did what they wanted <laughs> to do. <laughs> and sometimes the, it's like, whose line? The points, the roses don't matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we return to Kruvayan, still smoking his pipe in the clearing at the pond. A fog begins to creep in slowly. And a voice calls out, Dr. Kruvayan. Kruvayan turns around to see Yavutic standing next to the ancient carriage, pulled by two black horses. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it's explained a little bit later, but I was like, how are you here? Well, plus it looks very (laughs) suspicious and it's giving recently resurrected. Um, Yeah, a little bit. And he's just like, hey. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the fog, that looked really cool. The way it rolled in. Yeah. Well, that probably would have been like, that wasn't there before. No. No. (laughs) Maybe that little girl at the end was right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) She's not doing this tomorrow. But Yavutic tells Kruvayan that Princess Katya has sent him because her father is very ill and begs him to come to the castle. I just want to say, Yavutic, of course, made that very hasty retreat. Yeah. But I love to think of him with his ear to the door. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, I got it. (laughs) The perfect opportunity. (laughs) Where's that carriage? (laughs) Right, I fucked up. I can fix this. Yeah. Yeah. I got to make a quick stop at the Garouge plantation. (laughs) But. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> but Kurvayan agrees immediately, but says that he needs to alert the folks at the inn first. But Yavutic says that he won't need to because he's already done so. In fact, he says, they told him where he could find Kurvayan, which we learn is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is really funny. <laughs> Yeah, what the uh, Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> such a lie. Yeah. <laughs> but he literally went to the end and he's like, Dr. Kruv, I am this. And they're like, oh, he's smoking a pipe in some scary clearing, I believe. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> thank you, man. Good day. Good night. <laughs> but Kruvayan accepts this and is let inside the carriage, Yavutic closing the door behind him with an eerie creak. Church bells ring in the distance as Sonia watches suspiciously from the shrubbery. Now, I will say the narrator said that these church bells will keep the evil away. I guess not <laughs> Yeah, after 10 or yeah. something. <laughs> the bells don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the music rises dramatically around them, and we see Yavutic whipping his horses to carry them forward. It looks a lot like the filming methods that we saw at the end of Black Sabbath. Mm, okay, yeah. yeah. The way the trees are moving around. Yeah. yeah. I love it so much. I did. I for a second and I don't know if this was just my imagination because when he w- and when they're in the ride when we see Kruvayan inside the carriage he's like looking around and kind of bouncing around yeah I uh, like I said I don't know if it was just me but I almost thought maybe like when they got in the carriage and he took off like he went over the trees and then he was like they mm. were like flying oh shit to it and he was kind of like what the fuck's going on but then <laughs> you when Santa they're Claus? there <laughs> yeah <laughs> well he's all he's also a ghost he is yeah, yeah. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants that carriage looks badass just oh, throwing that out yeah there. absolutely but when they land and he's just really cool or like when they get there and he's <laughs> really cool it's like uh that's why right. uh, my note is why <laughs> is he so unbothered yeah, yeah. <laughs> This dude, even if this is all on the up and up and somebody had a medical episode in the middle of it, like he's still, I know that you don't want your doctor to be like, what's going on? <laughs> but still. But a little urgency. Yes. Yeah. He's so Look, chill and unbothered. And I know urgency for a situation like this. Yeah. yeah. But Kruvayan is watching from the window and I'm sorry, but even from the back <laughs> watching the way he's whipping these horses. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, dude, we can, I'm sure 
Prince of Ida is fine, dude. We you <laughs> don't have to do what, this. Yeah. What is waiting for me when I get there? Like yeah. there's gonna be a a even a touch of nerves for the most well adjusted person. Yeah. This dude just does not give a fuck. No. no. And he is. He seems a little uneasy because of the way the speed of the carriage. Yeah. Right. But he's like, I guess we'll get we're making great time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to go fast. Yeah. yeah. And I will say this is something that we talked about a little bit on Demons, Mm -hmm. where we had said that the geography of the interior of that theater made no fucking sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I had read that it was an homage to Mario Bava because he kind of operates in his own kind of dream logic when it comes to geography. Okay. Because we kind of noticed that the distance between points doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, Yeah. because the cemetery when they were at it versus the cemetery at the end, like that doesn't make sense yeah Yeah. and then even the distance to the castle sometimes you're right there sometimes it takes you a fucking man beating the hell out (laughs) out of horses an undead man to be specific (laughs) but it's wild yeah (laughs) but it always serves its purpose for whatever is needed at the moment it does and it does kind of lend this kind of like eeriness to it yeah to where you're like sometimes we can get to the castle in five minutes sometimes we're like it feels like days away Mm -hmm. yeah But suddenly, the carriage stops, and Yavutic lets Kruvayan out, and we see that they've arrived at the Vida's castle. I did want to point out that some of these exteriors are a real castle. Damn! It's Castle Massimo in Arcelo, Italy. Okay. Mm. And they used a lot of the exteriors we see a little bit later as seen by a fountain. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the interiors, if not like 98% of them, are all sets. Damn. That's really impressive because not saying like I know we talk about like uh, how they had to use whatever techniques they had back in the day, but I would figure that they would want to like, look, these places exist. Let's just go film right there. Right. You know what I mean? But to have to replicate all this shit on a set to like we're probably only going to use this once (laughs) (laughs) and what's wild is how it feels real yeah the textures of the walls the artifacts yeah the aged crypt Mm -hmm. it all feels like an actual lived in place and that that i noticed that when i seen the fireplace yes and i was like that's really fucking cool yeah one thing i will say is they did mention on commentary about the budget of this film being far more than Italian films previously. Okay. And the time to shoot was, they were given more time than most Italian films were. Okay. So you kind of see this effort. Yeah. In things like this, where they're like, we can spend more time. Yeah. And more money on this. But the two men walk inside, Yavutic leading the way with a lantern. Kruvayan is led into an opening in the wall behind the fireplace, which closes behind them, and things begin to look very familiar. Kruvayan surveys the cobwebbed Vida artifacts, continuing to follow the light of Yavutic's lantern. He calls out to Yavutic as he falls behind him, and when he rounds the corner to meet him again, only finds a lantern hanging on the wall with no sign of Yavutic. That was really cool. Yeah. I liked that a lot. Yeah. He's like, too fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point now do we do we kind of like... Uh, I've been it? had. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry, dude, but Kruvayan is clearly, he's, he's a skeptic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this is... It's too much. It's like already, it's like, I know where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> like, All that stuff I broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All that blood I bled. <laughs> that bad I killed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kruvayan reaches for the lantern and it clatters to the floor but another door in the wall creaks open suddenly in a way that only a haunted door can <laughs> Kruvayan steps inside without question and after a momentary glance around the room finds that he's in the Vida crypt and standing once again in front of Asa's broken coffin the door closes behind him and he looks around for a way out but is startled by a silhouette watching him from a distance. He returns his gaze to the broken window of Asa's coffin, only to find that she isn't there. He looks away for a split second when a stone falls across the room, then peers back into the coffin to see that Asa's body has returned, and she rests there with a smile on her face, locking eyes with him. He tries to run away immediately, rushing up the stairs, but the door to his exit closes before he can reach it. 
He then heads back downstairs through the darkness, but stops dead in his tracks when Aza's coffin begins to shake. Kruvion gasps as the shaking ceases, but the unsettling silence is broken when Aza's coffin bursts open, revealing her body lying there prone and reanimated. She breathes heavily with a mad stare in her eyes, her chest rising and falling in her black dress that she definitely did not have when she was killed that night. <laughs> but I will say, because it, it was confusing to me because Gavutich is wearing the same clothes that he wore then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She is wearing this black dress. I don't know if they changed her before they buried her. Or I like to think maybe if you're in cahoots with the devil and you're evil and you come back to life, you get a new dress. <laughs> all right, all right. They're like, look, nobody cares what he looks like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the devil's like, I bought this for you. I thought yeah. you were going like to You're going to look great. <laughs> But Aza calls out to Kruvayan, telling him that she's been waiting for him, and she extends her hand like a claw, scratching against the shattered stone of her coffin. She tells him that she needs him again and orders him to look into her eyes. She shares that a few drops of his blood brought her to life again, and she then says that all of his blood will give her the strength to seek out her vengeance and implores him to come closer and that her lips will transform him. All of my blood, but I need that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't come back if yeah. I don't have it. Let me keep 5%. Yeah. <laughs> I need just a little. Just a little oh. to get by. I will say there. Th this line is filled with excellent pickup lines because that's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is what I was talking about with the eroticism. Because mm -hmm. this is very erotic. Yeah. Yes. But she informs Kruvayan that he will be dead to man, but he will be alive in death. Kruvayan marches forward as if in a trance, and the music simmers around him before growing dramatic. I loved the score here. Yeah. Yes. It's just this impending moment that you know is coming. Yeah. But he leans his head down slowly, his lips meeting Aza's in a kiss of life and death. This, again, is another thing that's very interesting to me, mm -hmm. because it's not shown her drinking him. Yeah. yeah. It's just shown this kiss. And so you kind of get this almost sexual undertone mm -hmm. right. of vampirism in general mm -hmm. to where it's shown this way. And we see later, you know, different people have certain bite marks and things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and, you know, and again, that could come with a lot of uh, people's opinions on this confusion between vampires and witches. And but I think that it works very well for this film and for Aza as a character. Yeah, well, anyway, it, it always starts out with the kiss, right? It How started did it end out, up yeah. like this? <laughs> <laughs> it was only a kiss. Yeah, well. It was only a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know it was more later. But, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did say in the AIP version, they show her lips ready for his kiss, and then they cut to black. Okay. So I don't know. They, uh, I don't know. AIP, they cut so much stuff. And then the things that they cut that were so important to Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. I just don't really agree with anything they do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a very cool shot that follows this moment mm -hmm. of the castle Vida. And I learned on commentary because you see it's like the silhouette of the castle, the light of the moon, and the clouds passing. Yeah. It is. A combination because the left side is a miniature, mm -hmm. the right side is a cutout, huh. and the moon is just a shining light with airbrushed clouds <laughs> moving over it, and Mario Bava did it all. That's incredible. Yeah, that looks good. It's movie magic. Yeah. Yeah. But meanwhile, Prince Vida is still going through it, struggling to communicate as his children tend to him. Katya wonders what could be taking Boris so long, but Constantine assures her that he'll be back soon. The prince then cries out, The griffin! The man in the painting! Constantine just thinks his father is delirious. What? This was infuriating. <laughs> yeah. This was infuriating. Because you were there when we were talking about that griffin. Yeah! You were present and seated when we had that conversation. That was the whole thing. Yeah. The man in the painting, there is a fucking man. In the painting. <laughs> like, he's like, Dad, shut up. Like, you're talking nonsense. Yeah, and I thought we all agreed that the griffin was different in the painting now. Or it's yeah. still there. They agreed, and then Katya was like, I think it is. And he's like, no, it's probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. 
But the fact that you're acting like this is gibberish pissed me off. Yeah, yeah. Constantine's like he's had like 14 hot times. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he's drunk. He's drunk. Yeah. <laughs> we had to cut him off. <laughs> Grain of salt. <laughs> but his throat feels great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he's able to scream like this. <laughs> But the prince rises from his bed, telling his children that only the crucifix can save them on this day of death. Just then, he spies (laughs) Kruvayan through a crack in the door, who stands there menacingly in low light. He then steps into the room with a sinister look in his eyes, but Katya then recognizes him and expresses her gratitude at his arrival. Kruvayan immediately looks worse for wear. Yeah. Yeah. He looks she's like, what happened <laughs> since the chapel, Literally. sir? Literally. She's like, where's the hot one? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you? <laughs> but Kruvayan excuses a returning even from the prince's chambers and tells Katya that he'll take a look at Vida. He approaches him and waves his hand in front of Vida's face clearly just flat out hypnotizing the prince in front of everyone and Vida slips into a slumber but Kruvian just tells the concerned Katya and Constantine that it's nothing serious and that Vida simply had a slight shock it's like what was that yeah, yeah. I'm yeah <laughs> <laughs> I was flabbergasted yeah. <laughs> he could have gone sleep yeah. yeah for what he did yeah and then he's like, cool. oh, thank God. Like, like, oh he's shock, you've said? He's going to be fine. Yeah. Oh, that Cute. explains. Thank yeah. you, doctor. Thank you, thank he's you. Like, step aside and let me get a look at his neck. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? Well, he's a man of medicine. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Constantine explains to the doctor what happened, how he heard his father's scream and rushed in to check on him and found him fearful and holding a cross as if to ward off some horrible apparition. <laughs> Kruvayan has an immediate reaction to seeing this cross, turning away from it and snarling, keep it away. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, just doctor thing. Yeah. <laughs> totally normal. <behavior. laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> from who, him or you? Like, we <laughs> heard you. Just throw it out the window, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> But Kruvayan calms himself and he suggests that they keep the cross away from the prince because it could uh, provoke another attack. Come on. I'm fine. <laughs> this is for your father's this sake. Is yeah. <laughs> well, this you- is a complete stranger too. Also. Yeah. So it's not even like we have an established trust with this doctor. This is not your father's doctor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is just some man who's hissing at crosses <laughs> and hypnotizing <laughs> this man. Like it's crazy. <laughs> it made me think of when Dracula and Renfield meet for the first time and he's yeah. like, oh shit. <laughs> like and so yeah. clearly or when he smacks the mirror out of <laughs> Van Helsing's hand. It's yeah, like, dude, that- only not suspicious <laughs> at all. Only monsters would react this way. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, first things first, let's burn this cross, right, guys? <laughs> then we'll tend to your father. <laughs> but in the crypt, we find Yavutich affectionately combing through Asa's hair with his fingers and caressing her face. He expresses his gratitude for her breaking their eternal sleep and tearing him out of the earth, which weighed so heavily on him. He promises her that she's not alone and that he will bring her Katya's body and she will be her victim. He says that Katya was born for this fate as she is Asa's living image. He assures her that destiny has its way and through Katya, Asa will live again, speak again, and smile as she does. He tells his lover that they will live once more as they used to. Good for them. Yeah. Yeah. They found a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can finally go on that cruise. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, that was in the plans, yes, yeah. <laughs> in the 17th century. <laughs> I look this to me, mm-hmm. and I thought it as I watched it, and then Tim Lucas talked about it on commentary. Yeah, for me, this scene feels out of order. Okay, because this seems like something that Yavutich would do immediately. immediately. Yeah, right. Right after he was risen from the ground mm-hmm. yeah before he starts thinking about stealing a carriage from elizabeth bathroom <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay and for me i just i i appreciate more of this i want more of this okay this is why yavutich is doing this yeah, yeah yeah because he loves her and also it is a little odd because the placement of this scene if you're thinking about it she's already drained and turned crew violent. that's what that's yeah. what confused me okay so, because i'm like did i miss something or am i not fully understanding what's going on here because 
it does feel very out of place. Mm-hmm. And again, this could have been like a very like dark love story. Yes. Because the love story that we are served, I'm sorry, I'm sending it back. <laughs> yeah. I don't want it. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it's so forced. This would have been, this is like an ancient dormant love that's been real well it's yeah infinitely more interesting and you see them especially in this scene yearning for this previous life yeah, yeah. that was taken from yes them by the vita family yeah. yeah and so you feel more sympathy for them through this if they flesh it out a little bit more absolutely yeah. but we cut to kruvayan still standing in vita's bedroom and the way that he's lit, he appears as if maybe he's been drained of all his blood and brought back. <laughs> <laughs> to, to <laughs> but he, he does appear quite ominous as Katya checks on her father. She tells her brother to get some sleep and that she'll stay with their father. But Kruvayan excuses them both to get some sleep and assures them that he'll look after Prince Vida. But their conversation is interrupted by the sound of howling dogs outside and Katya asks Even to quiet them. She then reiterates her request for Constantine to get some sleep and says that she'll stay with their father, to which Constantine finally agrees. We watch as Even quiets the dogs. It's two Dobermans, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know dogs at all. I will say (laughs) 1960s dogs do not look like dogs now. No, they don't. So nobody knows what these dogs are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> actually he quiets the two mystery yeah. dogs it was funny to me that <laughs> they're not even the same animal all right <laughs> it was funny to me though that when he goes to quiet them they're not making a single sound yeah. no i was they're like, like did they forget to dub the dog voices <laughs> do i think they're like that wasn't us dude <laughs> <laughs> we're as scared as you are right we're inside right? yeah <laughs> we were sleeping <laughs> don't leave me alone with them. <laughs> did you hear that too <laughs> <laughs> but the wind howls outside as Katya holds her father's cross and peers out of the window. She then returns to her father's side, adjusting his blanket and taking a moment to collect herself. With her eyes closed, Kruvayan reaches out a hand to her and she jumps in fright. But Kruvayan explains that he thought she had fallen asleep. And he says that she should probably go to bed now. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you want us out of this room so bad? Dude? Yeah, are you a vampire? Or are you going to rob my dad? I don't yeah. know what the fuck. Why, going. Why do you want me to leave so bad? Either yeah. way, I'm not comfortable. Yeah. And where does he keep his rings? Though? Yeah, but, <laughs> I you would, can leave the necklace there. Yes. <laughs> Is that a sack with a dollar sign on it? No. No, that's my medical supplies. <laughs> it's S for supplies. Yeah. <laughs> it's S for stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> but very menacingly, he says that he'll stay here and watch her father. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather you didn't. Yeah. Yeah, I'm being completely honest. <laughs> Katya reminds him that he's supposed to be leaving Mirgorod at dawn. But Kruvayan says that it doesn't matter and that he'll stay the night here. <laughs> It's like, oh, you will? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. You're going to miss your fucking parent. No. Yeah. Or, well, wait, were you asking me or were you telling yeah, me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and dude, I'm laughing because poor Andre is just at the hotel. Yeah. yeah. Just in a drunken Sleeping it super. Off. Yeah. <laughs> but Katya takes one last look at her father, remarking that he seems to be much calmer now. Kruvayan assures her that he'll have a restful night's sleep tonight and that she doesn't need to worry anymore. Probably like the longest sleep he's ever had. (laughs) (laughs) He guides her to the door and Katya tells him that she doesn't know how to thank him properly, but to alert her if there's any changes in her father's condition. He's like, there'll be a big change. (laughs) (laughs) I I will say. (laughs) I assure you. (laughs) But she shows him where his room is down the corridor, bidding him good night and thanking him yet again. Katya leaves and Kruvayan closes the door behind her, redirecting his attention immediately to Prince Vida, slowly taking steps toward him as we fade to black. After an atmospheric shot of the surrounding landscape at dawn, ominous music accompanies our discovery of Katya asleep in her bed. Suddenly, Constantine bursts in, waking her up, and simply cries out, Poor father! (laughs) Katya screams, No! and she reaches for her brother's embrace. Even heads into the room meant for Kruvayan, but finds it completely empty, and the bed is made. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) But Katya, against Constantine's protests, 
rushes to her father's room, the camera swirling as she screams at the sight of her father's corpse, his eyes still opened and his face ragged with decay. So very interestingly, I heard on commentary that the rig used to accomplish this shot Mm -hmm. was designed by Eugenio Bava. Oh, wow. For use in his son's film. Damn. (laughs) All right. It's a family affair. Yeah. Yeah. But back at the inn, Andre attempts to wake Kruvayan, knocking on his bedroom door, but he obviously gets no response. The innkeeper descends the stairs, telling Andre to his surprise that Kruvayan has already left the inn. She explains that last night he was called to the castle as Prince Vida was <laughs> has taken seriously ill, but Kruvayan hasn't come back yet. And this is proof yeah, that Yavutich really came here. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> and he squared it away. So that means that he came looking for them. They gave him all of his stuff and they took it with and he took it with them to go find the doctor? I guess so. Oh yeah. Because he didn't he wasn't carrying any of his things. No. Yeah. <laughs> you went through a things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess he did. God damn. <laughs> like, here you go, Mr. Ghoul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a nice night now. <laughs> but Andre wonders why Kruvion didn't take him along. But the innkeeper tells him that Sonia saw Kruvion enter a stagecoach that came from the castle to pick him up. Maybe he didn't take yeah. you along <laughs> yeah. because you were trashed. You were <laughs> yeah, so drunk. I was like, you were drunk as fuck, yeah. dude. What do you mean? Why didn't he take me along? <laughs> He's like, but I want to see the princess. <laughs> <laughs> Andre requests a horse, which the innkeeper is eager to supply. But before leaving, Andre checks his shirt to make sure that he looks as dapper as possible. (laughs) (laughs) I also thought it was very funny how he asked for the horse like a glass of water. Yeah. And they're like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, right away. (laughs) (laughs) But outside of the inn, Sonia launders linens in a nearby creek, threatening to fix some other children if they knock over her baskets. (laughs) I'm like, damn. (laughs) She's got done washing those. Yeah. (laughs) Andre rides over an adjacent hill, asking for directions to the Vitus castle, which Sonia supplies to him. But of course, the kids do knock over one of the baskets, and a white dress goes sailing through the water, the eyes of the children following it until it reaches nearby rocks, and right next to these rocks, laying dead in the mud, his eyes frozen forever in fear, is Boris, the Vita's stable hand. Okay, so I was like, where the fuck is Boris? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's who you're expecting to show up at the end or whatever. I'll be honest, things are getting out of control. I'm getting mad at these kids for not realizing that their father's being hypnotized and set up to be <laughs> murdered. I forgot. Yeah. Uh-huh. And these kids finding him is fucking terrible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't expect this. I will say that. No. When he asks for directions and whatever, and like genuinely, we get to the spot where. Boris says and he's there I was like oh shit yeah he's just thrown in the fucking creek Mm -hmm. which is like (laughs) what was the sequence of events what happened I think Yavutich was waiting for him (laughs) (laughs) and this is this might be Boris's carriage that he stole that's what I thought okay but then how did he ride it silently he's like I've converted the horses (laughs) to ghosts (laughs) (laughs) I've killed I've also killed the horses (laughs) like I don't know I don't either (laughs) But Andre arrives at the castle, attempting to knock on the front door, but eventually just lets himself inside. He enters a large entryway with a staircase at the other end and calls out to Kruvayan. But it's Constantine who greets him at the stairs, asking who he is. He's never met him before. Yeah. Andre introduces himself, explaining that he thought he could find Kruvayan here because he heard that he was called to the castle. Constantine confirms this story, recounting the night's events, and declares that if Kruvion hadn't left his father alone, he might still be alive. He admonishes Kruvion's strange behavior, and Andre agrees, even more confused than Constantine, considering he's known Kruvion for years. Andre can't make sense of the peculiar behavior, adding that even when he left the inn this morning, Kruvion still hadn't returned. This surprises Constantine, who invites Andre upstairs. So did Constantine think that he's just like, later? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Went back to the end? <laughs> After he was very adamant about staying here. Yeah. yeah. But back at the river, a group of uncredited townsfolk lament the death of Boris, one wondering aloud how he ended up here, and another answering, the river. <laughs> 
<laughs> it brought him here. <laughs> Wait, can't you see he's dead? <laughs> Wait, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? I know it's early, but don't ask me shit like that again, dude. <laughs> Seriously. Don't waste my time. Yeah. I laughed out loud. And that's the end of the scene. He's like, <laughs> yeah, that was it. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lit. <laughs> <laughs> like the river, you fucking idiot. <laughs> cut and cut. <laughs> perfect, guys. Perfect. But back at the castle, Andre is taken into Prince Vita's chambers by Constantine, where he meets Katya again. He examines the prince's body, and when he turns his head, he discovers a fresh wound on the side of Vita's neck. Katya faints at the sight of it. But Andre catches her, and when directed by Constantine, takes her into her bedroom and sets her on her bed. He steals a few glances of her on the way, and is clearly quite smitten. Yes. But as she returns to consciousness, Andre unbuttons the top button of her shirt, which reveals a very important crucifix, and I swear he's only looking at the crucifix. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Um, is that our... What so she can breathe better? Like what? What? What are you? What? Why did you do that? I felt a little weird about that. I don't know. I was like, dude, what are you doing? I hope he's a man of medicine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As we've said, I hope that it was just for the crucifix. Yeah. But he did get it. He, he zoomed in. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. yeah. But Constantine fetches some water for Katya. And Andre dampens a cloth and wipes at her brow and her cheeks as a very romantic piano plays. It's their love game. (laughs) Yes. Katya opens her eyes and her blurry vision becomes clear as she sets her sights on Andre. But this little romantic moment is interrupted when the townsfolk from the river are heard entering the castle on the first floor. They tell Evan that the features of Boris's face have changed and they aren't even human anymore. They remark that it appears like the face of Satan. I... We saw him in the water. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. They were like, that's Boris. Yeah. <laughs> like they knew him. That's ju- yeah, that's just what Boris looks like. And they have, uh, dude, I don't have on just like in my brain, just, oh, that's what Satan's face <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looks like. Like it must be it Satan. It must be the devil, I think. <laughs> but they add that it appears as if the demon had devoured Boris from the inside. They're promptly shushed by Evan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, come on, man. He says it is not the proper time to tell them about the death of Boris following so shortly after the death of their father. But? But Constantine descends the stairs, irritated, and asks Evan what all of this is about. Evan solemnly shares that they found Boris's body <laughs> <laughs> down by the creek, like almost immediately. <laughs> they don't need to know that Boris is dead. What's going on? Boris, Boris is, is dead? <laughs> <laughs> Why well, he asked, I guess. It was immediate. <laughs> but it's funny because Constantine almost like dickishly, he goes, Boris's body? He's like, <laughs> yeah. who cares? <laughs> like it was just, it was kind of a wild <laughs> character moment, I thought. <laughs> But the townsfolk add that Boris's eyes are bulged, his teeth are bared, and his hands were clenched. Andre joins Constantine on the stairs, asking where the body is now, and they share that Boris's body was taken to the sacristy, and that the priest is with him now. But among the crowd, Andre calls out to Sonia, who rushes over to him. He asks her about what her mother told him, how she saw the carriage that came to fetch Kruvion the night before. She explains that she saw it when she was returning home from the barn. When she heard the noise of it, she hid in the bushes. And she shares that it wasn't Boris who was driving the stagecoach, though. She knows Boris very well, but this was a stranger that she had never seen before. Andre tells Constantine that he's going to go to the village to examine Boris's body, but he implores Sonia to come with him and tell him everything that she knows along the way. The crowd disperses, and Andre brings Sonia into Vida's chambers, and once there, she immediately recognizes Yavutich's painted portrait as the man who came to pick up Kruvion last night. She swears it, but Katya returns to the room, discounting Sonia's story, and pleading with Andre and Constantine not to believe this wild story about a man who's been dead for centuries. You look just like that painting right there. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're being very skeptical. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I, this was very weird to me. One thing I did want to point out that they mentioned on commentary mm-hmm. is that there is the potential of some plots being switched around. Even Barbara Steele said this a lot in interviews that the script was being rewritten sometimes on the day. Ooh. And so the issue was that maybe 
in some versions of the script, Aza took over Katya early. Oh my okay. God. And so this reaction would make a lot more sense if it was Asa and not Katya. Yeah. Okay. Has there been another goddamn rewrite? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to. No, I know. But that <laughs> that makes so much more sense because even when she was talking about it with her dad, yeah. she was the one that's like, I don't even like going near that painting. Like, mm-hmm. it makes me feel weird. Uh-huh. And now she's like, shut that little <laughs> fucking kid up. I bet and she's just, too scared to go to a barn at night. <laughs> You're not going to believe a girl who's too scared to go to a barn at night? Hey, stranger, that's weird, right? <laughs> Shame this child. <laughs> and so I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, it it did it it did feel weird as well. Think us talking about it, thinking about it a little more. Because watching it, I was just like, I was just like, okay, what? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You just get kind of confused, and then we go past it. But thinking about it, it's like, yeah, why? It does feel very out of place. Why are you skeptic now? Again, uh, we talked about the Griffin earlier. Uh, yeah, Constantine was the one who was like, whatever. But <laughs> she believed her dad. Yeah, she was like, yeah, it is different. So it, it does make sense if that's true. Yeah. yeah. But I. But you can't just leave that in there if that is a dropped plot point. Yeah. No, but I mean, we need we need this scene. No. <laughs> <laughs> we need parts of it, you know. <laughs> we need parts of it. So leave it all in. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just confuse our audience. Yeah. <laughs> we'll it's fine. work around it. It's fine. But Andre puts a hand on Katya's shoulder and he, I don't know why, but after she says this, he goes, calm yourself, princess. It sounds condescending. (laughs) Yes. But she's actually a princess. And so it is halfway fine, but not completely. (laughs) But Andre excuses himself and promises to return. Constantine offers Andre a place to stay for the night and Katya holds his hand, telling him that they'll feel much safer with him around. But at the sacristy, Andre meets the priest, played by Antonio Piafederici. After surveying Boris's body, Andre remarks that it's incredible. Boris died in the exact same way that the prince did. He lowers a sheet over Boris's face, adding that the two wounds on his neck look like the work of a wild beast, but one who punctured the flesh without tearing it. Yeah, that's what wild beasts do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're known for. Being neat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Concise, precise, and neat. <laughs> But he says that as a doctor, he has complete faith in science, but, and he just sighs. His thoughts return to Kruvayan, still in shock that he would abandon his patient in the middle of the night without a word. He even tells the priest about what Sonia said about the man in the painting being the driver of the stagecoach, but he says that it makes his head hurt and he doesn't understand. But this piques the priest's interest. He knows of this old 17th century painting of a man dressed in black with a griffin embroidered on his chest. Andre is intrigued by the priest's reaction, but when asked for any kind of elaboration, the priest just offers nothing. But before Andre leaves, he informs the priest that Constantine would like for him to make preparations for Prince Vida's funeral tomorrow, and the priest promises he will before ringing the church bells. Now, real quick before we move on, I I couldn't help but notice... Mm -hmm. Our priest kind of looks like Iron Man in the disguise. <laughs> he, look, the wig and b- beard are fake. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Very clearly. And there was a photo that was shown to me this morning, and it does look a lot he like... He really, <laughs> really does. Robert Downey Jr. It was weird. I was like, what? Because I'm watching it. You know what I mean? I'm paying attention. I'm like, all right. Mm-hmm. And then he did. He turned, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, what? And he showed me the picture. I was like, well, I'll be damned. <laughs> <laughs> looks just like him in a fake beard yeah <laughs> so it's got batman it's got constant yeah, yeah. <laughs> and iron man yeah that's gotta be worth like two points jp i gotta yeah it's racking up <laughs> <laughs> the church bells ring loudly but back in the castle the side door to the crypt opens and out step yavutich and kruvayan yavutich gives the simple order go and Kruvayan does, marching forward with his order. Katya, however, returns to her room, distraught from the events of the day. As she unbuttons her top, the curtain behind her begins to move, and not from the wind. But upon returning to his room, Andre goes through his belongings, the triptych icon that he stole from Oz's tomb clattering to the floor. But back in her room, Katya sits at a vanity, dressed in her nightgown, and after she ties her hair up, she slowly removes the crucifix necklace from her neck. 
Immediately after she does, she sees from the mirror that a shadowy hand is reaching out to her from behind the curtain, causing her to rise up from her seat and run from the room screaming. They pointed this out on commentary because we see that she's sitting at her vanity, Mm -hmm. but in the shot of the hand reaching out, we never see her mirror at all. Yeah. And so what Bava did as this little attention to detail to prove that she saw it through the mirror is that he flipped the footage. Ah, wow. okay, okay. <laughs> so it gives this illusion and we never even see it but we feel like we did yeah. yeah but her screams get the attention of andre who meets her in the hall with even and constantine she tells the men that someone is hiding in her room behind the curtain even is ordered to stand guard in the salon as andre and the vitas rush back to katya's room andre checks behind the curtain but he doesn't see anything and he assumes that katya must have just imagined it but Katya is insistent that it happened. She crumbles into sobs in her brother's arms, and Andre announces, I'll go get her a sedative. <laughs> Which is wild. Yeah. Not a sedative. That made me laugh out loud. <laughs> tell, yeah, tell me you don't believe me without yeah. telling me you don't believe me. Literally. And she's got to go to bed. <laughs> you must have imagined it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here, have some unconsciousness. Like, yeah. that's crazy. That's exactly. I'm a doctor. Yeah. I'm, and I'm in love with you. It's like, what? <laughs> But as he rushes down the corridor and back into his room, he doesn't notice that behind his bedroom door stands Kruvayan. As Andre reaches into his medical bag, he's startled to see Kruvayan inching his way toward him. Andre asks where he's been, sharing that he's been searching for him all day. Which, no, I don't think... (laughs) No, not really, but... I swear you are my priority. (laughs) (laughs) No, you were not. (laughs) But he notices Kruvayan's hair and complexion have completely changed since he last saw him. And Kruvayan just offers a warning, urging Andre to go far away from here and not involve himself in matters that don't concern him. This did surprise me that there is still some morality left or something because I was like, maybe they only have beef with this family. Uh But Boris is not in this family. Well, he's been here long enough. Come on, man. (laughs) (laughs) We see Boris around. I was... Well, he's you, an honorary he's a part of yeah. <laughs> well you heard dude he said he was born on the property yeah yeah i I just didn't expect i was like oh andre mm-hmm. yeah but he's like dude get the fuck out of here <laughs> which is funny because it's like why are you approaching me so menacingly yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but andre does not get the message and he tells kruvayan that since he didn't return to the inn that he brought all of his things here and he shares that he was trying to decipher an inscription on the triptych as soon as he unveils it to Kruvayan, Kruvayan literally runs away. Yeah, <laughs> what the That's fuck? it. Again, <laughs> things I was not expecting. <laughs> not a word. He literally turns tail and runs. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but in his pursuit and in Kruvayan's hasty escape, Andre is too distracted to see the door leading to Asa's crypt swinging closed because in front of the fireplace by this secret door, the family dogs are found mortally wounded. Constantine rushes over and discovers that they're bleeding to death, and Andre very calmly answers, Yes, and I think I know who. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's it. What? <laughs> Maybe a little more reaction from what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I know who. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Is it your buddy? That's so did, funny. Did your buddy attack my dog? So uh, let me go on and get the fuck out yeah. of here. Like after that warning, and then my mentor is like running, down, running away. Yeah. And stop. I'm, I'm goodbye. At the sight of religious iconography. Yeah, yeah. I love you, Katya. Oh, it is. <laughs> fucking hair is weird oh dude i love you but i'm gonna love you from over here (laughs) but the next morning as preparations are made for prince vida's funeral the priest arrives at the castle he speaks with andre and constantine and andre tells him about the night before when he showed the icon to kruvayan and he took off running disappearing without any explanation (laughs) the priest finds it difficult to translate the inscriptions on the icon but he says that if he's allowed to take it with him, he can compare it to some text that he has in the library. Andre appreciates his help, but Constantine then asks the priest if he can try to convince Katya to leave the castle for a little while, considering how hard she's taken recent events. Recent events like yeah. her father 
family friend, mm-hmm. dogs mm-hmm. all being murdered. Like she's like really blowing it all out of her fortune. <laughs> <laughs> like she's saying it so hard. Like that's wild. Yeah. Leave the castle and go where though? I don't know. Man. Like <laughs> anywhere that doesn't have a painting of her on there. That I would mean, help. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> that's probably stop one. Yeah. So really anywhere else. But Andre peers out of a nearby window on the property and eyes Katya resting lonely outside by old ruins of a fountain. She stands in black next to the rushing water, and Andre takes it upon himself to accompany her and finds her outside, saying that he hopes he isn't intruding. Katya says that he isn't, but that she feels so desperate and alone. Andre pleads with her not to despair and reminds her to always have faith in herself and in her life. But Katya asks what her life even is but sadness and grief, something that destroys itself day by day and can never be rebuilt. He's like, if only someone could help you rebuild it, like mm. a like a doctor or something, <laughs> like, like a big, strong doctor. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're I being mean, very obvious. Does, yeah. <laughs> but Katya gazes at the ruins, calling it the living image of her life. Consumed hour by hour, abandoned to a purposeless existence. Andre says that even if this castle is abandoned by man, there's no reason that she should do the same with her life and her youth. He implores her to go away from here and says that she'll be happy again if she does. He's like, and I'll go with you. (laughs) (laughs) But he calls her by her name and he tells her to remember that he'll always be ready to help her. Katya thanks him for his kindness, but remarks that everything feels so hopeless, perceiving a sense of terror, a presentiment of death. She fears that she's been destroyed by something inside of her, but she seizes his hand, wishing that she had Andre's faith or his strength. Andre holds her hand tightly, asking her again not to despair, and says that even here in this garden, the sun will reach into the darkest corners and chase away the shadows of the night. Tearfully, and seeking his embrace, Katya begs Andre to help her. All right, that line was pretty good. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going give, to give Andre that one. That was pretty good. He's been quite slick. Yeah. <laughs> he has, but like, uh, what about your homie though, man? Well, he's that he just ran away. Fled? <laughs> yeah, that was on him to run away. I tried to talk to him. <laughs> so can we find where he's at? Yeah. I think he's after me. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I don't care. I'm leaving with Katya. Yeah. yeah, it's like, that is not my problem anymore. No. <laughs> even we'll deal with that. What, <laughs> what were they even here for? Because they weren't here. For, we, they weren't in this town for this. Oh, they were going to, the, they were trying to pass through to go to that Congress. And so then they fuck got that. stopped. Yeah. yeah. That was okay. today, oh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, has anyone seen Dr. Kruvayan? Yeah. He's like, maybe that's where Kruvayan ran to on foot. <laughs> it's like, oh shit, the conference. <laughs> well, he said to take him with the grain of salt. He did. He did. So, he, did. he did. I will say that this entire scene was cut in the American version, which to me doesn't make any sense because we really need to establish more of this to even achieve the ending we're going towards. This is all yeah. that we have in way of an actual connection between the two of them. Yeah. So if that is the story that you're telling, it's foolish to not include yeah. this. But inside the castle, the flames rise in the fireplace and a funerary decoration on the wall begins to sway a little too close to a large candle. It catches fire almost immediately, but even notices it, beating the fire to put it out, and once the decoration is free of flames, it falls to the ground, but behind it, it's revealed that Even's bashings have torn a hole in Yavutich's painted portrait. Behind that is a large hole in the wall leading to a secret passageway. In his defense, it really looked like those holes were already there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't cool. think he did that. <laughs> my my thing is like this these so these portraits must have been hung specifically by Asa and Yeah. 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 Oh no, yeah. Because it's hiding this secret but two hundred years you've never dusted. It's like a, you've it's never it's a load bearing oh. thing. <laughs> <laughs> well on the cool though it and we'll see right now in a second, but there's a fucking big ass lever right there. There, and it's very, it's used, it's been used. We've <laughs> <Yeah>. seen <laughs> quite a few times. But as they return to the castle, Katya thanks Andre, telling him that without him, she doesn't know if she'd have the courage to go on. Andre struggles to find the right words, but he asks Katya when this is all over, and he reaches for her, but she stops his reach, simply thanking him again for everything. 
But we cut to Ethan showing Constantine the corridor behind the portrait, and as they ponder where it could lead, Andre enters the room and Constantine tells him what happened. Constantine then climbs inside to investigate, sharing to the men that it's pitch black inside. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this sounds like the best place to go, yeah. for sure. So this didn't help at all, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually the way to John Paul's mom's basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> But when Constantine accidentally moves a lever, the men hear the creaking of the secret door behind the fireplace as it opens. Constantine realizes that his father wasn't delirious, remembering his last words, the silver griffin, and the man in the portrait. Andre recalls the dogs that he and Even found last night, bleeding to death when Kruvion disappeared, and he suggests that they all go inside the secret passage grabbing a candle to light their way. Even goes to join them, but is promptly told to stay behind to make sure the door doesn't close. He's like, and make us a toddy. We'll be thirsty <laughs> when we get back. When we get back. <laughs> I get the door, but that's fucking hilarious. Let's all go and let's not split up together, except for you, Even. Yeah. You stay there. Yeah, no. <laughs> Alone. You yeah. stay alone. And the other thing is that even whenever they were rushing to make sure that Katya's room didn't have an intruder in it, he's like, you stay here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he wants him to get killed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but through the corridor, Andre and Constantine find another painting of Asavida. This one is a nude portrait. And while Constantine recognizes her as the woman in the portrait in the salon, Andre recognizes her as the woman from the crypt. Mm. Okay. So this is very indicative of gothic horror in general, mm -hmm. of these things kind of hidden, this secret past returning, yeah. all these things. And it's such an interesting representation, having this public picture in the salon mm -hmm. and having this private one hidden in the walls of yeah. the family home. Yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, Tim Lucas made a lot about it on the commentary and mm -hmm. uh, he, he's right to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but Andre explains how he and Kruvion found the crypt accidentally and investigated it. But suddenly something catches his eye. The painting itself is another secret passage and he turns it to allow their entry into the room behind it. Even with only one job to do, turns away from the secret passageway door. <laughs> <laughs> this allows the door to close on its own. Of course. As soon as he realizes it, he is seized from behind by shadowy hands, a rope tied around his neck. Well, now we're now this is Clue. Yeah. Oh. We're in a secret passage. We got a rope. We got, you know, yeah. hands <laughs> and gloves. Um, this is Clue. Yeah. Yeah. I just hope that toddy recipe is written down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> his toddies will be missed yeah. <laughs> i don't know i am but but in the passage andre and constantine find asa's body resting in the remnants of her broken coffin andre remarking in confusion that two days ago the tomb was intact constantine adds that asa looks as if she just died and asa begins to breathe andre pulls constantine away delivering the brilliant line we're in the presence of some unnatural mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm yeah. so glad yeah. <laughs> that we have a doctor here to, <laughs> to walk us through this. Yeah, right. Thank you for that. Thank yes. you. Yeah. I'm telling you, there are so many moments like this, but for me, it's a lot like Universal, Yeah. where it's adding such charm to this film. Yeah. <laughs> it's like these moments are killing me, but in the best way. Yeah. yeah. But Andre suggests that he return to the priest for his guidance, and he rushes Constantine off to return to the castle and protect Katya. I feel like somebody should probably keep an eye on her. Yeah. She's, we see her breathing. Yeah, yeah, and they're just like, let's get the fuck out of here <laughs> in two different directions. <laughs> Constantine directs Andre up the stairs to get to the stables quicker, and after taking a disbelieving look at Oz's body, Constantine runs back the way he came. When he stopped to linger, I thought she was going to have him. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, that's it. But thankfully for him. Yeah, because he, he'll be fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> After exiting the first passage, Constantine makes it to the door that even was supposed to keep open. But of course, it's closed. 
He tries to wrench it open, screaming for Ethan, but when it fails to budge and he gets no response, he runs back in the other direction towards the painting passage, but the entry to the crypt is now closed too. But Andre has already made it to the cemetery with the priest, who explains that there's no doubt that they're faced by the unleashed powers of the demon. Was that a little jarring to anyone? Well, it, again, this geography, it's <laughs> yeah. like yeah. in the time it takes him to run to a pass and be like, oh, can't get out that way. He's gone for help. And- yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's already met with the priest and mm. they're already taken him to the cemetery. <laughs> but the men pull at the cemetery gates, which is held closed by naked branches. And the priest explains that the icon enlightened him on what needs to be done. They need to find the grave of Yavutic before sunset. Great movie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> they wrench the gates open and rush into the cemetery. But inside the passage in the castle, as Constantine ponders another way out, a light slowly illuminates Yavutic, who has stood there all along, blocking the painting from turning. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And the illumination of him reminded me a lot of Michael Myers. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very iconic shot. Yeah, yeah, I can absolutely see that. But Constantine gasps and the shadows swirl around them as Yavutic advances on him. Constantine stumbles to the floor, falling through a large hole that I do not know where it came from. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it almost felt like you wanted to fall down the hole. <laughs> <laughs> he was around the rim. He, yeah, uh, he, he was there for a felt while. Felt that there was nothing there and then was like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I got a zombie advancing on you me. Know, yeah. We'll take our chances in the hole. In the hole. In the mystery yeah. hole. <laughs> <laughs> But back in the cemetery, Andre and the priest skulk around in search of Yavutic's grave until through twisting branches, Andre discovers Yavutic's discarded mask of Satan. Well, that's not a good no. thing to yeah. find. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great thing to find. Okay, I guess. For them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he picks it up, calling the priest over as the wind begins to howl. And the priest admits that it's just as he feared, and he knows for certain that they'll find him here now. They walk a little further, and Andre discovers a freshly dug grave, and the men begin to dig through the dirt to get to the coffin below. They tear the boards open, and lying in Yavutich's stead is the eyeless corpse of Kruvayan. His eyes being gone was scary, but mm-hmm. did anybody else think it was funny that they put him in here? Oh. Or that he put him in here? I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was confused. I think it's, it's, I would love to know the course yes. of events. Right. Please. Much like how he did away with Boris, did Kruvayan run away? And Yavutic is like, dude, I told you this. Yeah. And then he's like, that's it. We're done. Close him up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what? But Andre speaks through his bewilderment, recounting that he just saw Kruvayan alive last night. He moved, he spoke to him, and he even ran away. But the priest assures him that Kruvayan was already dead, despite how impossible it seems. He states that sometimes Satan, with his capacity for doing evil, even plays tricks with the dead. And sometimes dead is better. Yes, I've yeah. heard. I've heard. I've heard such things. Yeah. We're about to learn once more. <laughs> <laughs> Andre shudders as the priest places his crucifix onto Kruvayan's forehead, and it begins to smoke leaving an indentation in his ruined flesh. Very familiar mm-hmm. to a couple of movies we covered recently. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, man, this movie's influential. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. The priest says that this is the proof, and now they must find a way for Kruvayan's poor soul to rest in peace. Andre asks how they can do that, and the priest seizes a long nail from an errant piece of wood from the coffin explaining that the inscription on the icon indicates that this is the only way. We watch as the priest drives the nail into Kruvayan's eye socket, blood bursting from it, spattering the priest's hands, and we hear Kruvayan's scream echo through the cemetery. That's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Was not expecting that at all? No. No. And this was, uh, for me, this is where I was a little confused, period, about what was going on here as far as, like, this this world here because we did just see this dude and you're saying it's he's playing with the dead but are you telling me that was his ghost that was doing all of that yeah has he been dead this whole time or did you just throw him in there you know earlier or like you know what i mean i don't where 
where is his has his physical body been in here and we've just been experiencing his spiritual body or is he a so, vampire is he a ghoul is he because even the way we're i guess getting rid of them is not <laughs> typical vampire lore mm -hmm. you know what i mean there is no stake to the heart it's in the eye so so there's a thing called astral projection all right, right. <laughs> and dr kruvion is a very accomplished <laughs> <laughs> astral projector all i'm right. presuming his father was also uh -huh. so there's what we need there's actually <laughs> drawings on kruvion's yeah. wall yeah. at home and then and i then flew, flew away, away. <laughs> <laughs> no but i interpreted it interpreted it as that was his ghost the first thing you said okay that's what but i don't know because was he supposed to maybe kill andre and he didn't and so they were like you're done yeah i don't i don't know they've not explained <laughs> it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> the way that i see it it was kruvayan actually physically there okay. okay and i think that yavutich was incensed with him for not carrying out his order <laughs> is that okay. why he ran away yeah because <laughs> yeah. he said he said go yeah He's yeah like you're supposed to do this and he didn't and now we see in the castle and we'll learn very shortly yeah yeah yavutich is having to do it all yeah okay and okay. he's tired dude he just got up he, and he slept for oh, a very wow. long time I mean, his face probably hurts i get <laughs> it i'd be mad too <laughs> hurts? <laughs> he just ripped it out yeah he did oh yeah he did have to do it on his own yeah there was relief though i heard <laughs> and he was alive though <laughs> or like he was awake at least Staza had Kruvayan pull it off when she wasn't awake that's true yeah that is that's true that's true also how come Aza just gets to lay down <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah that I don't know <laughs> Well, she has these servants of the devil, which is what her brother said they were. Uh -huh. Yeah, but her her husband or her whatever partner, whatever he yeah. is. Uh huh. Well, he promised to do it for her, so he's just carrying it out. And she's like, "I'll be right. I'll be yeah. <laughs> under the tree with the vine." <laughs> <laughs> but as you probably assumed, the actual shot of the nail going into the eye was only in the Italian version. Mm. Okay. And taken out of the American. I again, it is very interesting to see this at this time, that level of yeah, like brutality and violence. Yeah, but it is very striking. Yeah, but the priest wipes his hand with a cloth, certain that the spell is now broken. Andre laments the death of his mentor, but the priest says that now they must take action. The evil is proven. The witch had transformed Kruvayan into the slave of the devil, dead during the day, but alive by night, so he can carry out Satan's nefarious orders. Oh, so that kind of explains it. Yeah. <laughs> we probably should have waited. <laughs> but isn't is another dude wandering around all the time? At night. We never get daytime in this fucking movie. It's dude. daytime right now, and he just accosted Constantine. I think it's cloudy. It okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's unseasonably it's over the yeah. death. <laughs> it's enough. enough of a gray area. It's enough. <laughs> Andre worries that the prince might be a slave of the devil as well, and the priest says that they should make haste before the witch regains her life completely. Andre asks how she could do that, and the priest says that she'll possess and enter the body of another young woman. Andre obviously knows that it will be Katya. The priest urges Andre to go to the crypt before sunset and pierce the left eye of Asa. And he says that he will do the same thing to the body of Boris, which is still in the sacristy before rejoining him at the castle. Andre makes haste as told. But back in the castle, Katya makes her way through the salon, stopping to pay respects to her father who rests in a coffin, surrounded by candles at the center of the room. There is a very cool moment of these candles being kind of unveiled by the camera mm. and they're punctuated by stings in the score. Mm. So it's just like trying to keep you on edge. Yeah. Okay. And it's very interesting because we know that Yavutich is roaming around the castle right now. Yeah. Yeah. But she crosses herself and then calls out to Ivan and Constantine. When no one answers her, she grows fearful, rushing through a corridor to a door at the end of the hall. Once there, she opens it to find Evan's legs swaying in front of her, the servant's dead body hung by the neck from the floor above. I was not expecting that. No. no. 
It's like when they find the cook in the freezer and clue. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I re- hung up. Yeah. No, well, I was not expecting that. No. He grabbed him with that rope by the throat. Yeah. But I, I mean, I don't know. You, you have to assume it's gonna be something with. I guess. Well, but yeah. I, but I think the discovery. Yeah, it just yeah. felt very brutal yeah because yeah. i mean even the other two that were found they're laying down like mm-hmm. they're like you know what i mean they're not like i that was a lot and there were i mean ghoulish happenings for really all of them yeah yeah where vita was drank dry mm-hmm. yeah boris well he might the river yeah, the yeah. River. <laughs> he's, he's dead can you see that river got him so but yeah the this is this him. is like a and well that is another thing to consider <laughs> is that Yavutich was buried in the section of the cemetery reserved for murderers. Okay. So maybe he's just going back to what he did. Yeah. But yeah, this I, I was the same way. I was like, I was like, holy shit. I was not expecting to see that no. again for 1960. I was yeah. like, holy shit. Yeah. And you see his face and he yeah. is yeah. not with us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but Katya screams for help from her brother and from Andre running back to the top of the castle and returning to her father's body in the salon. She collapses onto him, begging him for his rescue from these horrors that surround her. As she cries, a shadow darkens a nearby window, and when she opens her eyes, she finds that her father has returned to life. His eyes spring open, perching his hands on the edge of the coffin as Katya falls away, calling out to her father. The prince tells her that he is no longer her father, His blood is no longer her blood. The spirits of evil have rendered that tie between them forever, and an accursed poison flows in her veins. Katya faints. Well, yeah, but at at least you were honest. Thank you for your honesty. (laughs) He's like, I'm not your fucking dad, dude. (laughs) It's like, really? (laughs) That's what you think? (laughs) But we get a few shots of Andre riding back to the castle as fast as he can, But inside, Prince Vida seizes his daughter, but is stopped by Yavutich, who cinches his hands around his throat and after a contemptuous glare, tosses Vida unceremoniously into a nearby fireplace. (laughs) Damn! Yo, that's the funniest shit in the world. I'm going to make you a zombie slash vampire just enough for you to wake up and your daughter see you wake up. Then I'm going to let you try to kill her, but then I'm going to really kill you. <laughs> you are just so she fire. can watch me kill you as a vampire. It's too yeah. much. <laughs> so one in the fire, one in the water, uh-huh. one took the air away. Yeah. And the earth. One. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So fucking Captain Planet episode. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's also when you think about it, Yavutich can't allow him to hurt Katya. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's like, "Mm -mm -mm." yeah, Yeah. no, his body's taken. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But the prince's body burns as he writhes useless against the flames. In a close shot, we watch as his face melts, his eyes bulging from his sagging skin. I loved that. (laughs) It's incredible. I heard on commentary that this face was sculpted in wax by Eugenio Bava. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and more wax. Yeah. yeah. There is something very incredible about his wax work because every single time it appears so close to the actor. Yeah. So many times in these old movies, it's like, oh, that's a fake head. Yeah, but it looks great. Yeah, but this, whenever he does it, and even, I think, even's corpse above isn't completely yeah him yeah so it's like this is just great work mm-hmm. they should have gotten him for the house of wax remake oh no. yeah, they, oh, wow. <laughs> they needed to get someone for the house of wax remake <laughs> anyone <laughs> maybe even cancel the project <laughs> 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 But Yavutich looks on as Prince Vida dies for the second time before collecting Katya into his arms and exiting the room. Andre finally arrives at the castle, pounding on the front door and calling out feverishly for Constantine and Even. But Yavutich has already brought Katya down into the Vida tomb and holds her body over Asa, promising the witch that her vengeance is now at hand and soon she will be free forever. Meanwhile, Andre has scaled the front wall of the house like Sean from Shaun of the Dead <laughs> and crashed through the window to gain entry into the castle. 
I laughed out loud. Yeah. It looked hilarious. It did. When you're in love, you... No. <laughs> <laughs> do your thing, man. You would do anything. <laughs> but he leaps inside, landing like a superhero, and rushes down a corridor, calling out to Constantine and Katya. But in the crypt, Yavutich relieves Katya of her funerary gown, tearing it off of her, but he retreats when he hears the frantic voice of Andre on the floor above. He leaves Katya resting next to Asa's prone body, and as soon as he departs, the witch's hand seizes Katya's wrist. Andre continues his search above, but stops for a moment when he discovers the prince's body is missing from his coffin. But he ventures forth still in search of Katya. Katya, however, with her wrist in Asa's clutches, begins to moan, and we watch as slowly her face becomes aged, withered and wrinkled before our very eyes. But contrarily, Asa's face grows more youthful and radiant, the lines in her skin fading away until she appears exactly like Katya did moments ago. Her eyes open, glowing white, as she's finally free from the clutches of her death 200 years ago. Amazing. So impressive. Yeah. I was very amazed, especially for the time that this was filmed mm -hmm. and there was no cutaway. When I think of these kinds of transformations, I think of like the Wolfman. Yeah. In 41. Yeah. When you see all these cuts and you see, oh, he's getting more hairier as this thing goes yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Where you can kind of clearly see these edits, but to see all of this done in one shot, I was like, I need to know how this That's was That's what surprised yeah. me. Yes. It's, it's, it's just there. Right. I learned on commentary, firstly, Galatea film, they wanted this to be filmed in color. Okay. But one of the many reasons why Baba couldn't film it in color is because of how this effect was done. Mm -hmm. So the technique used for this effect, Baba lit the set in various colors, which is what we're used to seeing in Baba films, of course. Mm -hmm. But it was to bring out different values and effects in the black and white photography. Okay. And so... Doing this, this aging makeup is accomplished by using wrinkles and age marks that are drawn in a red grease pencil, and it's hidden by heavy red <sighs> lights. This light is dimmed and then blasted through a green film gel, which makes the red photography photograph black in black and white. <laughs> so as he's doing this and he's dimming it, you'll have... Katya start to appear older. Yeah. And as he does it in the reverse, you'll have Asa appear to look younger. So just playing with the lighting. Just playing yeah. with the lighting. That is unbelievable. That's really That's cool. That's so innovative. Yeah. Too. yeah. He had said apparently that Bava had learned this technique because there is a film called E Vampiri. It is considered the first Italian horror film in the sound era. Mm -hmm. And Bava, I believe, was the cinematographer for it. <laughs> okay. But he learned this technique there. And it was said on commentary by Tim Lucas that the technique was actually pioneered in 1925. Holy shit. Damn. Yeah. But I mean, think about it. What do you really need? Yeah, just like, light. Yeah. yeah. It is a shame because there are photographs of the set of Black Sunday where all of these different lights are used and we see it kind of appears much more like a Mario Bava film of the mid to later 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay. But because of these effects and honestly, it this film kind of, with everything that is kind of paying homage to, it really needs to be black and white. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And so I very much would like to see it in color, but I feel like it is perfect as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially if we get this kind of work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that is kind of wild that is not considered very often is that idea of these different values of black and white being brought out through different colors. Mm -hmm. If you've ever wanted to see like this in action, look up photos of the set for the Adams family. Okay. And it is so colorful. You wouldn't even believe it. That's wild. That yeah, that's crazy to think. Yeah. But Andre makes his way through the secret passage as fast as he can, but he's stopped by Yavutich, who immediately begins to fight him. The fight is well choreographed, but with very poor and awkward sound design. Yeah, I, <laughs> and I'll be honest, I did not expect any of this to culminate in a fist fight. Yeah. That was I, surprising to me. There has been a lot of magical happenings. Yes. Well, yeah, because even Kruvion, and he was one of their flunkies, he did the wave, he did. you know, and was knocking people out or whatever. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, he's Vucic, like, I'm gonna kick your ass. Yeah, yeah like, that, he's like, well, I'm personal. sick of it. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Get over here. <laughs> But the two men struggle to the floor. In the crypt, Asa rises above an unconscious Katya, acknowledging that Katya never knew that she was born for this moment, that her life was consecrated to her by Satan. But she asks if she could sense it, and she realizes that Katya must have, which is why Asa's portrait was a constant temptation to Katya, and it frightened her from a very young age. Asa posits that Katya felt that her life and her body belonged to Asa, and she felt like her because she was destined to become her. She calls Katya a useless body without life, and remarks that the love that Andre had for her could have saved her, and they might have even been happy together, but Asa was stronger, and now Katya will enjoy a beautiful life of evil and hate. I feel like you're already taking my life force. You don't need to fucking drag me as well. Uh-huh. <laughs> but what do you mean his love could have saved me? What was that? Yeah. Whole thing? How much did he pay you to say that? <laughs> 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 and you could still make it. Yeah. <laughs> if you leave with him right gonna, now. <laughs> but you're only going to get out of this with Andre. <laughs> I think that her saying that is her saying Yavutich's love saved her. Okay. Okay. And so... She's saying that the power of love can do things like this, but not for you because it's me now. Right. The power of love. (laughs) Asa reaches for Katya's hair, but upon brushing it from her neck, finds that Katya is once again wearing her crucifix and Asa recoils in terror. So you see this very cool split stone of the coffin. Uh This is used as a divider so that Mario Bava can divide the frame. Right. And Barbara Steele can play both characters. Both, yeah. All right. But meanwhile, Andre and Yavutic are still beating each other's asses. (laughs) (laughs) But as they struggle across the floor, they come dangerously close to the random hole that Constantine fell through earlier. Andre falls into it, and barely hanging on to the edge, Yavutich realizes that he has the upper hand. But as he goes to send Andre tumbling to a certain death, two hands reach from the abyss below. It's Constantine, who seizes Yavutich and pulls him down into the hole, sending him falling into the pit. He said, surprise, bitch. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> Thought you'd seen the last week. <laughs> I, think, I think for me, this, this entire sequence... Mm-hmm. Where's the music? Yeah. Yeah, I wondered that as well. Yeah. I don't know if it's the version we watched, if maybe the Italian version has music here. Yeah. Maybe the AIP version. It seems like the version that we get on Shudder is kind of a combination. Okay. It feels like the Italian version because it has all that gore and violence, Uh but dubbed in English. Yeah. And I'm like, did you forget a sound? Yeah. Because this would it, it it the drama is so high. Uh-huh. Yeah, we need that tension of that music. Like, oh okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just hear right. footsteps and breathing. Yeah. And kind of squeaking sneakers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Andre climbs out from the pit, helping Constantine out of it too, and cradling him in his arms. Constantine, his shirt torn to ribbons and his chest and face bloody, pleads with Andre not to worry about him, and with his dying breath tells Andre to save Katya from the witch. But outside, for some reason, the entire (laughs) town (laughs) has mobilized with torches and pitchforks and they descend upon the castle. I guess it was the priest. You're right. But it's still hilarious because it's so jarring. Yeah. I think because what I thought the priest was going to do is he was just going to take care of Boris and then meet Andre at the castle. Yeah. Yeah. But he's like, no, I'm bringing (laughs) hell with me. Yeah. (laughs) The entire <laughs> town and bring your torches and pitchforks. Yeah. Dude. yeah. You saw 1931's Frankenstein. Yes. <laughs> We're doing that. <laughs> but Andre, however, makes it to the crypt and he embraces Asa, thinking her to be Katya, relieved that he arrived in time to save her. Asa plays along, lying that the witch wanted to kill her, and asks Andre to kill the witch before it's too late. Andre agrees that they must destroy her forever, and he knows how to do it. He breaks off a sharp end of a candlestick and raises it above Katya, who lies in the remnants of Asa's coffin. Asa looks on, beaming with delight, but before Andre can bring the weapon down, he notices something. A crucifix 
worn on the supposed witch's neck. Andre lowers the weapon in confusion, removing it from Katya's neck and placing it on her head, just as the priest did to Kruvion in the cemetery. But nothing happens. He doesn't understand, but when he approaches Asa and attempts to try it on her, she wrenches herself away from him, tearing her gown open to reveal a hollowed out and skeletal torso underneath the fabric. Damn! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, I wasn't expecting the uh, insides. No? No, like, not uh, at all. That was pretty cool. Um, but I, I do I do got to ask, um, Andre, how what, what have we been dealing with this whole time, man? <laughs> what have we been doing, like... The, the 20 minutes it takes him to figure out, and then he's like, this necklace, what the f- I know it means something. What do I do with this? I really thought it would be a moment of, no, it's me, it's me, you know what I mean? Yeah. But no, he's just like, oh, thank God, caught you, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Phew, what, how is she wearing that necklace, dude? That's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, let's get out of here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love you, let's go. But Andre can't believe his eyes, and Asa covers herself, backing away from him and revealing that no, she is not his love, and that there, Katya lies dead forever. Asa glares at Andre triumphantly, declaring that her vengeance is now complete, as all of Katya's family is now dead. She implores Andre to look into her eyes, the way, she says, that Kruvion did that night, and urges Andre to also lose himself deep within her eyes. I feel like you probably shouldn't use Kruvion as bait. Yeah. When I saw what happened yeah. <laughs> to Kruvion, mm-hmm. and it didn't end well for him. Mm-mm. But with a sinister smile, she asks if he feels the joy and the beauty of hating. Now, this is not the original line. Okay. It is supposed to be, do you feel the joy and the beauty of Hades? Oh. Okay. But AIP was like, ooh, too spicy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Come on. Really? Yeah. After everything. After everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that we mm-hmm. have been yeah. through. We are, not, we are not glorifying hell like that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> there is one thing we don't do. <laughs> not in this house. At American <laughs> International Pictures. <laughs> But he's got the cool blue hair. He's like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Asa pleads with Andre once more to look. But suddenly, the mob from the town, led by the priest, bursts into the crypt. Andre alerts them that she is the witch. He begs them not to be fooled by her face, but look at her body, explaining that she drained Katya's lifeblood from her. I do want to say, speaking of Asa's skeletal frame, mm-hmm. there it. I just remembered, and it reminded me of this scene from Argento's Inferno. Okay, there is a really incredible transformation of a woman into a skeleton. Oh, okay, and it really is kind of reminiscent. And if I'm not mistaken, Mario Bava did some uncredited work on Inferno too. Oh, okay. So I don't. I maybe it's an homage as well. You Maybe know, you know what though too, and I you made me think of too when you were saying that huh. Candyman. Oh, his front is like that too. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that looks cool as fuck too. Yeah. Yes, it does. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. yeah, this movie is very influential. Yeah, and the Corpse Bride. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll allow it. Yeah, <laughs> dude. You know what? You reminded me because Tim Burton the shot of asa when her mask comes off yeah and you see all the holes Mm -hmm. sleepy hollow oh Oh, yeah yep i read that he clearly cited that as the influence okay and also the trees are very reminiscent too and sleepy hollow was a formative film yes like that was it borrows so much from gothic horror not just because it's gothic american literature Uh yeah but from films exactly like this yeah that was a cool ass movie. It was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but Andre orders the mob to take her, and they chase after Asa with their torches and surround her in the crypt. As the townsfolk drag Asa outside and erect a stake at the center of a mound of kindling, Andre weeps over the body of Katya. Asa is tied to the stake, and she stares at the villagers, her face stoic with resolve. But inside, the priest explains to Andre, who now watches from the window, what happened 200 years ago. Asa was meant to be burned at the stake then, 
but a storm prevented the flames from destroying her wicked soul. As Asa is set ablaze, the priest says that today, her innocent victims have broken the spell of Satan. Asa eyes Andre through the window as the fire rages around her. Distraught, Andre asks the priest why Katya was taken from him and why Asa is dying with Katya's beauty. He clutches Katya's crucifix and laments, Katya, my life is finished too now. What? It's been a day. <laughs> What's her favorite color? <laughs> Literally. Yeah, calm down, guy. <laughs> Black and white. Yeah. <laughs> it's everyone's favorite yeah. color. <laughs> in this weird universe. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking Pleasantville here, guys. Oh, oh no. I love Pleasantville. <laughs> but Andre asks how he could ever forget her or resign himself, admitting that he will never find peace. He directs the priest's attention to Katya, remarking that her young body has been destroyed. But as soon as the flames reach Asa, and she begins to howl in pain, her face grows withered and wrinkled as it once was, and as soon as she dies, Katya suddenly stirs awake, which gets the attention of Andre, who rushes over. Before his very eyes, he watches Katya's life and her youth return to her, and fully restored, Andre caresses her face and brings it to his in a kiss. We zoom in on the flames overtaking the stake and the body of the witch, and ghastly letters appear. The end. So, what did you guys think of Black Sunday? Uh, that was an ending, huh? <laughs> Just kind of done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I guess she did what she wanted to hurt their family and then she's like i guess i did enough i'll die in peace <laughs> i mean because that was just it it was just like oh no it's over yeah i was like uh, all right i mean everybody wins <laughs> well not <laughs> not constantine uh, not the prince no. not boris not yeah. even not i mean i guess just, just the hot Andre. girl that he wanted to <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> and he kept me he made a very big fuss about her being young he yeah, and you're the youth. Oh, youth. and Kruvayan too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Kruvayan's <laughs> also dead. <Jesus> <laughs> uh, but that's kind of what I was speaking about earlier. With you have these, it's kind of both sides. Yeah, yeah. Where you get this very powerful character in Asa. Yeah. But then also these social mores of the time of her youth is her currency. Yeah. yeah. And he he literally said her youth has been destroyed. <laughs> yeah. He says that. Dude. And now my life's over. Yeah. <laughs> or she was so pretty. I'm like, never going to get a girl that high. <laughs> <laughs> and I say at the time, but unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. No shit. You know. Um, but this was this was a very good uh, watch. Um, like I said, I'm not for a lot of the older movies, but, uh, this, this one was pretty fun. That was, this was pretty fun. I know a lot of the funny was unintentional. Um, but then again, I mean, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe he's like, oh, they're going to fucking laugh at that. <laughs> um, because a lot of it is, is played a certain way. And it's just like, you can't, there's no way even after you guys in 1960 didn't watch this and wasn't like, that's fucking <laughs> that's <hilarious." laughs> like that looked funny. Or you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause of course you do watch your craft or whatever you produce or whatever you make or put out. And, and like, that is, that is funny. You know what I mean? So I'm sure he was like, that's, that's going to be great. Um, but this was a, this was a very interesting watch. Um, and I would even again, you know, I, I, I say it, with uh uh with some of these older not a lot of them but with some of the older movies that we do cover and then it's like man watch this shit mm -hmm. please go watch this uh this is a good uh i don't even know if study is the right word but like to see where a lot of this older horror borrowed from or like where things start i know when we watched dracula we talked a lot about the lore mm -hmm. and how they invented this lore with the light and with this and that and it's like well they never even really said it it just kind of happened in the movie and then it was like no yeah i guess so and then that's what followed yeah so seeing this uh like they did this in Fright Night when he put the cross on his head and did all that. I know we talked about that too, but it is cool to see these movies where where you see these things originate from. And this is uh, the story needs a little help. I'm for me, <laughs> um, but but it is it is a really good watch and seeing the effects they did and a lot of the cool shit they did at the time. 
again, seeing some of those murders, the dude in the creek and the dude hanging, both times I was not expecting that at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And seeing it, I was like, holy shit, dude. In 1960, it was like, that's... And again, the effects, the way they did it, the, the attention to detail, the way that you can tell, they really, 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 this Mario Bava enjoyed everything he fucking did and you can see it even Mm -hmm. if like i said the story is a little funny at times you can still watch it and be like damn that's good that's funny that's whatever but you are still gonna be like that's fucking bravo dude like that was good (laughs) shit bravo Bava. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know? Very good. Is that um, all you have? That <laughs> and that you, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> and now you go. Um, no, I completely agree. I think that this is, it's such an interesting watch, not only because it is so visually satisfying and interesting, but to learn and kind of see, like you said, where we come from. Kind yeah. Of. Um, I think that the effects are shockingly good. Even learning how a lot of it was accomplished, it's so innovative and interesting. And I feel like with modern films, it is so easy to fall back on effects and and stuff like that. Yeah. And I love going back and watching these, even like in the 70s and, you know, not having those capabilities and just having to think on your feet or mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like we talk about Tom Savini a lot. I appreciate the innovation of, I need it to look like this and I have some condoms and I have some fake blood. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I need her to get old. I have a pencil and I have lights. It It's, I love that. I, it is a joy to watch and to learn about. And for me, that is, why you would watch this because yeah. again to me the story is a little bit of a mess yeah. <laughs> i feel like they were confused and so it made me confused and but the moments of unintentional humor elevate it for me and again yeah. i don't care if it was meant to be funny or not if him being like i'm gonna get you a set it like <laughs> you need to chill out like that's hilarious and <laughs> i don't really care you know if they meant it to be really the whole character of andre was just yeah. hilarious to me he was fucking hilarious and he didn't mean to be yeah um <laughs> it's so reminiscent of jonathan harker and dracula for sure okay. where, where he's almost kind of why useless. are you here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i love you yeah. yeah what um the forced love story again when you have a perfectly cromulent love story just sitting there mm-hmm. doing nothing that you refuse to flesh out which why yeah. You know, and and learning about rewrites and stuff like that, it becomes a little more evident maybe why things were dropped or why things were changed or why some scenes don't feel like they should go here. And, you know, I get that. But again, if you're in this for story, that's not what this is about. Yeah. Um, I think the performances were really good and interesting. I think the music was great. I um again the the big hit for me is just that the story is just not there for me and it is a very interesting foundation yeah but it's just like the way that things progress and then it's like yeah they get together whatever it's it's fucking over the end it's just like okay <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. you know but it is a very interesting watch to experience and to learn I, I just, I am always very amazed by it every time I watch it. Mm-hmm. It's so brilliantly made and crafted on a technical standpoint. Yeah. And there are some narrative issues. <laughs> I will agree. <laughs> but I, I just feel like for me, the atmosphere and the tone and the vibe of it, mm-hmm. at least for me, kind of do very heavy lifting to make up for those shortcomings. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I also think that when it comes to making films, Black Sunday does exactly what good art should. Mm -hmm. It borrows from what came before, it innovates, and it pushes the medium forward. Right. And this is a brilliant example of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an influencing links. Yeah. Yeah, which we've learned is a thing now. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm sure there was other stuff that came out later on in the 60s that had 
probably the advantage with anything that came out. Yeah. But you got to think this is at the very beginning of the decade. Yeah. Right at 1960. And they were like, look, we're going to use some wax. And I don't even know <laughs> if duct tape was there. But they're like, we're going to we're going to use it. Mm-hmm. And, and it looks fine. It doesn't take you out of that moment in the movie. No. Even though, you know, whatever. But it it it's. It's so good that it doesn't matter, you know, that that's wax. Mm-hmm. It, it's still, it's like, oh, no, that's that dude's head mount. Yeah. yeah. You know? And in that regard, it's very ambitious mm-hmm. because it's very courageous to try something like this. Yeah. And that's the other thing is, look, horror movies hadn't been made for a very long time. Again, this is the third sound era horror film from Italy. Yeah. And so when you think about it, let's throw everything at the wall. Let's have yeah. witches. Let's have vampires. Let's have zombies. Let's <laughs> yeah. have ghosts. And we'll just fucking have fun with it. Yeah. While also being so artistically incredible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's just like, it's 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 beyond. Yeah. But I think that can lead us into ratings. Yeah. yeah. So for me on the positives, it really is that cinematography, the motion of the camera, the beautiful lighting, incredible use of shadows, I think that visually in black and white, this film is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so amazed the innovations made by Mario Bava, how he pretty much again, and he will in a few more years, create basically a subgenre for Italy. Okay. He did with the Italian Gothic horror film with this. And then four years later, not three, (laughs) four years later, Blood and Black Lace. Right. Okay. Because I know a lot of people say things. Yeah. And they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the production design as well, the look of these ruins in the chapel. Yeah. The atmosphere of that crypt and the cemetery, the Vitus Castle, mm-hmm. everything, all the details put into it. And I know that to give these rooms such a different feel from the, like, it's just. It's so incredible. Yeah. And another thing that I learned as well, the area that they had whenever they were doing the scenes with the carriage, on commentary, they said it was about the size of eight horse paces. (laughs) And so every time we see them moving, this is Mario Bava being so creative with this small space that they have. Yeah. You see them riding. It's not real, obviously, because they can't. That's yeah. wild. But I am going to start measuring things in horse paces. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to give scale. No, I, have to, I have to, you know, I got to say. No, that. I know. And I, I will say, I, I love the idea of the story, even if the execution falters mildly. It has so much, and maybe all the parts don't marry together, but again, it's ambitious. It contains so many concepts and facets from classic horror, and it's just, for me, there's so much charm in everything in the way the story is told, Mm -hmm. even if there are little mistakes where it's like, well, that scene shouldn't have gone there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, It's finding its way to what it is, which is this just unique to me masterpiece Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i will admit that there are it's that issue for me i want more asa and yavutic yeah Yeah. because that love story is so interesting and especially they were taken from each other in the prime of their life Yeah. yeah and they've returned to each other now and we get one scene with them together really yeah yeah in the crypt and it feels out of place it does so that's one thing that could have been improved upon. And I will say, of course, but then again, it is kind of the style of the time or the style of the films that influenced this one. You know how quick those universal films end out of nowhere. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, there's the, the planet again. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I guess we're done here, folks. But I, I just think for me, this is just an incredible film. And I, I love the performances. I will say I know that, you know, the dubbing versus the on-set performances. But visually, the performance of these actors is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Barbara Steele does a great job. Of course. Both sides. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just, you know, it's it's incredible. I, I feel like in so much of it is artistry that is befitting of its time in some ways and then other ways so revolutionary at the same time yeah Yeah. i just uh i can't get over that age makeup yeah yeah that was real cool like things like that you're just like i can't even i can't even believe what i'm watching right now (laughs) (laughs) 
But I, I could go on and on. I, I love uh, Black Sunday. But for me, out of 10 menacingly macabre masks, I am going to give Black Sunday nine menacingly macabre masks out of 10. I will admit that the film is not perfect, but it is so good, so important, so influential, absolutely worth a watch, and I have so much fun, and I'm so amazed every single time I watch it. But I will now open the floor to you. No, yeah, man. I I agree with all the technical stuff, and like, you know what I mean? This was a really, like I said, it was a treat to watch because you do see like we said uh, at the very top about the mask it zooms in on the front and then it comes out the back mm-hmm. or, or through the back and then the front and we see it go onto her face you know what i mean like that was cool yeah it's just like uh if you really just sitting there like oh you just zoomed in whatever but it's like come on again in 1960 dude and then not only that it works so perfect for what's happening yeah, yeah. and it's like it does like you said it puts us in that moment the movie is really cool. I did enjoy everything, but for me, the story just, it was like hard for me to not pay attention, but it was just so confusing at times that I was like, okay, wait, because the thing about Yavutij and Asa, uh-huh. them being siblings or whatever and all that, like we don't ever see that. Or no. like they, how they said before, I don't ever see any of that. So I would have, like you were saying, the love story. But then the confusing thing we get about, like he's already dead at the beginning. Then we get her. Then it's two 200 years later. Then we're here. And then uh, Andre comes. And it's just like, I, again, I thought that, that was Asa at when they came out of the tomb. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I and then it's like, oh no, I met these nice gentlemen outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. what you did? Yeah, I, I think fuck? you're supposed to. I think it's supposed to be kind of this like, what the hell? Yeah, feeling or it, moment. But and and it is, but it just feels kind of jarring later. You know what I mean? As the movie goes on and shit keeps happening like that, and then the geography of how quick these people are moving around, or how you're getting from one place to another, and then you're coming into this cave, but now you're in this man's house, but then it's like, well, what, what happened? When did that happen later? Why didn't you come out of his fireplace when y'all were investigating <laughs> when y'all broke down? And then if you broke down right here, you were already in front of these people's house. Why did it take you another two births to get over there or whatever? <laughs> you know, it was just like I said, it, and and I know that's just more nitpicky shit. You know what I mean? And and but it it was basically just the story that kept like getting. I don't even want to say flip flopping because it was just weird. It was just at times, and I didn't know if they were vampires. I didn't know if they were ghosts or they were witches or they were. So it was like okay, and yeah, let's put them all in there. Fuck it. You know what I mean? I would have just liked to stick with one type of goal. If we could just pin it down to what it was, okay, it is a witch. Okay, you can kill her any way you want. You know what I mean? But the fact, too, that when he stabbed them, there was no spell, there was no incantation, there was no nothing. He's just, oh, you're dead. It was like, oh, <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's like, dude, you're the priest. Aren't you going to pray over him or you're going to whatever? It was just like, nah, this one's done. It was like, let's <laughs> move on. But but again, though, a lot of what you're saying too the unintentional funny, the things the way things it does give this movie that charm. Mm-hmm. It is worth watching. I I won't even be like, oh, I probably wouldn't watch this again. If if we're watching it, that's fine. You know what I mean? It, if even if some time has passed, it's like, you know what? Throw on whatever. You know what I mean? That's fine, too. That's cool. Um, I would would recommend anyone to watch this. This is a really good movie. Um, there is, like I said, you know, whatever. But I mean, even that, if you can get past all of that and just kind of pay attention to it, I mean, it shows history. You know what I mean? Of horror. Mm-hmm. And it's like you see like we as we were talking, pointing out things that we've seen from other movies like, oh, shit. It was never done before this. That's where that came from. Oh fuck! And you know what I mean. We and and this this is one of those movies to watch. And even I know you like to study them, mm-hmm. and you like the more artistic side of things. Um, I don't, but even I can appreciate what's happening here. Older movies aren't my bag, but even at that, I've got to show the movie love. You know what I mean. So for me, on a scale of one to ten menacingly macabre masks i'm gonna give 
Black Sunday a seven out of ten. I I would watch the movie again, and I I don't mean to make you upset, T, but I'm gonna make fun of the characters. Well, I mean, <laughs> some of them I deserve love, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of the things they do do is ridiculous into whatever. Do, but do. well, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Continue. But, <laughs> we're lowbrow and right, highbrow right. on this show. <laughs> Very lowbrow. My apartment's only like 50 horse yeah, spaces. <laughs> Forgive me. Oh, no, but but it is it <laughs> does it does add to the charm of the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. Um I totally agree. I think that this is a must see for sure. If you are a fan of the genre, a super fan of the genre, it is very interesting to see where a lot of these tropes and stuff come from and it's it's a special treat covering fright night and then doing salem's lot and being like oh this is clearly influenced by this and then doing black sunday and being like oh this is like that is that's a treat and the further back that you go it i it's just very much appreciated to kind of see where this genre that we all love comes from Mm -hmm. in a lot of aspects um it is again visually it's a treat i love the effects i love clearly all the work that went into this the performances the music the set pieces and learning how little they had to work with and what they made of it it's incredible um again circling back around my issue is just the characters and the story and again maybe i am very simple I'm just a girl standing in front of a movie asking it to tell her a good story. (laughs) (laughs) But that's, that's my, that's what I'm in for. And it doesn't deliver in that regard. It still is important and it still needs to be seen. But again, as I said earlier, if you're going into being like, Ooh, like 200 years, don't get like, don't don't get too excited. But in, in the abrupt endings, they make me laugh every time. <laughs> yeah. Even in the Universal films, it's mm-hmm. just like they're like, "Okay, get out." Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. Roll the yeah. credits. Roll the credits. Yeah. Literally, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> Why are you still here? It always makes me laugh. There were so many moments of this, and I had such a fun time discussing it mm-hmm. and kind of laughing at the ridiculous aspects of it and celebrating the really incredible, impressive aspects of it. Um, this was just kind of a treat to cover. And um, yeah, I, I had a really good time. Good. Thank you, baby. Well, I had a really good time. <laughs> um, but <laughs> That's not what she asked her to say. Either. Not, she said it wrong. She, she should have killed her right then. <laughs> um, <laughs> the devil's rejects. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all that being said, on a scale from one to ten, menacingly macabre masks, mm-hmm. I'm going to give Black Sunday 7.5 menacingly macabre masks when i was a kid i thought it was macabre i think we all did <laughs> um <laughs> is it not yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, fuck. oh no <laughs> <laughs> well that's all from us at pod mortem what would you rate black sunday and what should we watch next let us know on twitter at the pod mortem don't forget to follow us on instagram and like our sterile productions page on facebook be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at TravisMWH, at Blood and Smoke, and at RealStreeter84. Thanks again to Original Cinematic for sponsoring this week's episode. Please consider pledging to our Patreon, where you can get bonus content like The Corner of Creep and No Sleep, where we read and riff on creepypastas and Reddit No Sleeps, and Talk Mortem, the show where we answer your questions and take on random topics. Stay tuned until after the music for a special thank you to our Wendigo Gitter patrons. And remember... Your choices can have immeasurable consequences. When making a decision, consider everything you could be putting at stake. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned. We want to give a very special thank you to all of our Wendigo Getter patrons. Woo! Yeah! Yeah. I'm so proud of you guys. (laughs) (laughs) A special thank you to... Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Lala Thomas, Travis Anissa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Jennifer Perez, Allison O'Neill, Carissa, TJ and Angie Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Aplin Ontiveros, Karima Rhodes, 
Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Sidney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, J.D. Rezac, Molly Gerhard, Armand Spasto, Aaron Nagari, Eggy, William Berry, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Jordan Roberts, Dylan, Jordan Blevins, Liz Heath, Spencer Montavo, Pancake the Panda, John Ramos, Michael Newding, Alexis Roberts, Dan Laveau, Itzy M, Gary Horton, Leisha Olivier, Kate Lamp, Carlos and Sydney, Jessica Hunter, Helena Rudder, Alan Johnston, Mariah, Livy Fun, Scott Troutman Wise, Towton Watson, Mozzie Bear, Brittany G, Dave Burke, Adrian Stakes, Daniel McGinnis, Nick Spill, Emma Hagel Kissinger, Valerie G, Emiliana, Brian Glass, CB, Taylor Santana, Will Lewison, Angelique, Smelly Poo Poo Head, Beth Bauer, Cookie, Esperanza J, Jason Kyle, OKC, Danielle Peralta, Brandon, Nicholas Carter, Sawyer Reese Farr, Dr. Diva Loves Horror, Girl That's Scary, Cassandra, Andrea Simmons, Ashley Higuera, William and Zena Rush, Ryan Brom, Megan Ochoa, Laura Lassiter, Natalie de Guzman, Eileen O, Marissa E, Sydney, Henry F, Megan M, Strangely Sarah, Christy Beck, Nancy and Andy, Amanda Lopez, Andy Terrell, Jason Hanavan, Katie K, Erica Morin, Cameron S, Nicole Stewart, Tris Wynn, K.87, Mariah Jensen, Carrie A, Lonnie Lono, Powell, Kayla E, Maggie H, Murder Stina, No Thanks Tom Hanks, Kevin McGonigal, Kristen Marcy, Ori81 Bariqua, Look Like That One Girl, Bog Boy, Felnez 63, Alita Pui, Probably My Jugs, Kate Thackeray, Wade Pack, A Lizard, Bay J, J Rich, Jen Lassiter, Topher Williams, Elena Mettler, Neil Chesson, Valerie Kay, Christy Lee Kruger, Professor of Humanities, Laura McCarricker, Naomi, Josh Smith, Autumn Green, Heather Santayano, Abby Kopp, Crystal 831, Cassidy Carruthers, Skank Sinatra, Morgan Alexander, Tony Osteen, Julie Fredborg, Rihanna S., Daniel Taylor, Anna Kate, Heather Ortiz, Jen T., Kim H., August, Vengeance Spirit, Sam J. Green, Kelly Glazy Face Mac, Jenny May, Zoe Marie, Glittery Fab, Malik Caselli Armstrong, Scarly D, Toya Shea, Katie, Martin Shaw, Star, Tyler J, Daniel Dickerson, Jordan Gaddis, Cam Davies, Tanya Selvog, Patrick Hoagland, Raven, and the trash man Roger Dodger. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. We love you so much. And I have never said this before. Oh, my God. (laughs) But thank you for hanging with us. (laughs) First time ever. Ever, yes. Ever. Until next time.